we are on, Madam Monitor. We are, Your Honor. Thank you. We concluded the last session with an offer of proof concerning the technology of detection of hemoglobin. Attorney Manning, have you concluded that offer of proof? Yes, Your Honor. I would just like to be heard on it if I can. Yes. Thank you. With respect to the presumptive test, Your Honor, Your Honor has already ruled that it is admissible. What I would like to clarify, I know Your Honor is concerned with respect to the conclusive nature, if there's any, on the direct examination. What I would like to reiterate is the state is in no way seeking out a representation from the witness that this is a conclusory test. Number one, because it's not. Number two, because I don't believe Detective Riley testified to that, nor will he. What I would indicate is, fall back on the many arguments that we had on Friday concerning the fact that it does not, it goes to its weight, not its admissibility, and would focus as well on the fact that it can be cross-examined, which I'm sure he, Attorney Shoehorn, will cross-examine on that subject. Just because something is inconclusive does not mean it is inadmissible. With respect to the nature of the testimony, Your Honor, the witness was very clear that he had, he was trained by the lab, that he did this test, I forget how many times, but for how many years, numerous times. He was also very clear that it's a presumptive test, that it could be anything from human blood, animal blood, to also come out with radishes or something that is not blood-related. All of that can go to before the jury, and they can make their own determination. It really is, in the state's view, up to the jury to determine, in light of all the evidence that's presented, whether or not what Detective Riley testified to is blood or radishes. So the state would offer it. Attorney Shoehorn. Yes. What the state has not indicated is that there was no confirmatory test whatsoever. I spent the weekend looking for it, following when they took a swipe, when it went to the lab. There's no evidence this is even blood. So therefore, not only has it no probative value, as Moody points out, by itself, there's no confirmatory test whatsoever. But I'll go further. It was then sent to the DNA department at the state lab, and they found no DNA of Jennifer Dulos in that sample. It was, there was some unknown DNA that they found, but it did not apply to anyone connected to this case. So wholly aside, wholly aside from the fact that the court, that this is not a matter, as the Supreme Court said, where it's inconclusive, the Supreme Court has said it has no evidentiary value, no probative value whatsoever. Your Honor allowed, as I understand it, the limited information, because when it was collected on the floor, there was a suggestion that it was then part of the blood. It was a visible, there were some visible drops that were believed to be blood, and then Your Honor said it was sent on. But this now has to do with the Chevy Suburban. There is no evidence of blood, I want to emphasize that, that has, that will be introduced, that was even, to my knowledge, tested. I was looking for a confirmatory test. Therefore, and it's not the DNA, there was no DNA of Jennifer Dulos in there. So the sole purpose is prejudicial. The sole purpose is to give the false impression, and I'll emphasize, false impression that Mrs. Dulos might have been in the rear of that compartment, and it's going to be, I don't know when, somewhere down the road, where I'm only going to be able to cross-examine to show that it was not related to the case. So the state has, in my view, tried to introduce something that has zero evidentiary value, never mind getting to the weighing of probative versus highly prejudicial. It's to suggest falsely, it would be, in my view, it's as erroneous as putting on false testimony, perjured testimony, because it has no value even down the road. So the court made a ruling based on just what was presented at the time. We're going to allow a 
a, a detective who collected samples now to testify as to its meaning when all he did, as far as I can tell, is he gets kits from the uh, lab and has taught how to use it. I note that phenolphthalein, which is one of the things in the kit, you know, when I, previously, I don't have one now, I had an in-ground swimming pool at my house. That's what you test for chlorine levels. It turns red, if it's too dark, it gets uh, bright red. If it's just, if it's too little, it's pink. So that's what we're talking about, a little kit you put, you spray it in this case, or you put some on, you dab it on, and uh, I think, what was the second thing? Um, peroxide. Again, I don't have that much familiarity with um, hydrogen peroxide other than it's used to, for infection sometimes. I guess some people bleach their hair with it. But the fact that he's going to then go on and explain what it is when he has no scientific acumen whatsoever, there's no training in that, when the jury's going to be hearing this based on what I submit as a lay opinion, and then later on at some point we're going to hear it didn't lead anywhere. So I don't even understand why it's being offered. If, if I can just address the fact that counsel is comparing it to perjured testimony here, I want to talk about false representations. There are two items that I think are at issue and being should be separate, separated and clar clarified. One, the presumptive test that Detective Riley talked about with respect to the tissues or the, the paper towels, which I think was what, at, what the objection came from. The other he is now throwing into that same argument and objection <coughs> is the luminol pictures, which is the trunk of the Chevy Suburban. So to, just to keep those totally separate here, with respect to the uh, paper towels and the presumptive test that uh, Detective Riley did on that as well as numerous items in the garage that day, uh, the state will stand on its argument, but also reiterate the fact that a confirmatory test was not done at the lab, and it's purely on a presumptive level, level makes it even more clear to the jury the nature of this testimony. This is a presumptive test. It is inclusive. It's inclusive. It's not a conclusory lab test. It could be A, B, or C. Detective Riley is going to testify to that. It is clear. The jury can give it the weight it deserves. Switching to now the luminol, we can talk about false representations. Counsel indicated on Friday to the court that there was testing done on that trunk that came back that there was no blood in that um, Chevy Suburban. There was no testing that was done uh, with respect to blood on that trunk. So that representation is completely false. With respect to the luminol pictures, Detective Riley, when he testifies to it, and when we get there, uh, which I believe was Your Honor's ruling on Friday, that they were admitted for ID only until the offer of proof would come <coughs> with respect to those photographs, which the state was not able to elicit. But apparently we're talking about that now. Those, Your Honor, again, presumptive nature. It's a presumptive test. It is what it is. Just because it is inconclusive does not make it inadmissible in light of all the other evidence is presented. Thank you. First, the court will address the contention that the jury will receive a false impression that the blood of Jennifer Dulos was found in the vehicle. The jury will hear the testimony from this witness and essentially is not testifying as an expert. He's testifying about his training as to what he was trained to conclude based on certain circumstances and results. If the jury hears testimony about a presumptive test, and the jury has to understand what the term presumptive means, that's going to be up to the state or the defense or both. The testimony by this witness and the wide open avenue for cross-examination, in this court's view, does not allow the jury to fall simply into a hole of false impressions. 
court will allow the testimony. You can bring the jury in, please. Just for clarification, is the court also going to allow this witness to explain what the test does without a foundation as to his scientific, uh, lack of scientific ability, or is he just going to be able to state that he collected it for that reason? Well, the court is going to wait to hear the questions. And counsel has the opportunity to object. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. The council stipulate to the presence of all of the jurors. Yes, yes. yes Your Honor. Thank you. Is your witness here? He you is, Your Honor. The state you. would recall um, Detective Riley. If I may just inquire if anybody's um, television. And Detective Riley is still under oath. You may be seated, Detective. Thank you, Your Honor. Just indicate, just for purposes of the record, your full name. This is Matthew Riley, R E I L L Y. Yes, ma'am. If I may just have a moment, Your Honor, my wire got disconnected with the television. Your Honor, for the record, I'm calling up states nine. I believe when we left off, it would be on file three and photograph um, eight. Okay. Detective Riley, how are you? Good, ma'am. Thank you. Um, just to recap a couple questions, if you can take a look at the screen behind you. Again, states nine, file four, picture eight. And briefly, if you could just describe what's depicted in that photograph. Yes, that's a uh, paper towel roll that I found on the, uh, the counter of the kitchen island. It's 69 wells. And the 13? Uh, the 13 is a uh, evidence placard uh, that denotes it's going to be seized as uh, State Police Exhibit 13. And did you put that 13 there? Yes. Picture 9. Uh, what does that depict? Uh, that depicts uh, some of the blood-like stains I found on the paper towel roll. Now, sir, uh, did you do anything with that uh, paper towel holder? Uh, I field tested it for uh, the presence of blood, um, ensured it was uh, photographed and uh, documented, and then I packaged it. Okay. A couple questions, if I can. Yes. Uh, when you say field test, what does that mean? Uh, I field tested it for, uh, for blood. It's a, I used a, a screening test called the uh, Castlemeyer test. Uh, I would ask a question. No point objection. Thank you. And for this uh, test, I used two chemical reagents, uh, phenolphthalein and uh, hydrogen peroxide. Okay. 
And if you can just walk me through what exactly is a Castlemyer test? It's a uh, presumptive blood test. Well, I'm going to object, Your Honor, and there's been lack of foundation for this testimony. Well, the question is, what is this field test? And the objection is? There's a lack of foundation. This witness can ex Well, I think the question is, what is a Castlemyer test? Well, I thought the question was. If I can, Your Honor, I'll withdraw and, and go back. Uh, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit. Uh, sir, have you um, received any training with respect to conducting presumptive tests? Yes, I have. What training have you received? I've received training <clears throat> both at the uh, State Police Forensic Lab on this particular test and in uh, uh, one of the crime scene courses I took at the University of New Haven on, uh, on other tests. Uh, with respect to this particular test, uh, what year did you receive that training? Uh, to sometime in the early 2000s. And about how many tests have you performed? Uh, thousands, ma'am. Okay. Now, asking exactly how do you perform this test? Uh, you perform the test um, by uh, taking a swab, one of those long handle Q-tips, uh, taking some um, of the material, the suspect, the uh, suspected blood, onto the swab. Then you put a drop of the phenolphthalein on it, wait a couple of seconds. Then you uh, put a drop of the uh, hydrogen peroxide on it. And if you get an immediate color change, it'll turn a bright pink color. That's a positive test. Okay. Now, the, I'm sorry, did you say the phenol? I'm going to switch uh, Phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein. Where do you get that? I get that uh, chemical from uh, the State Police Forensic Lab in Meriden. And the other item that you use? Uh, which is the hydrogen peroxide and the sterile water that, I'll, that I use as a solvent. I get those from a chemical supply house. And are these uh, common tools on the van? Yes. Okay. Uh, are they designated in different tubes? Can you walk me through how you, how you store those chemicals? Uh, the chemicals are stored in a refrigerator on the van um, in a, you know, a, almost looks like a plastic fishing box. Sir, about how many uh, residences or vehicles have you processed in your career with the Western District Major Crimes van? Uh, uh, countless, ma'am. Okay. Um, it's uh, approximately a um, thousand crime scenes. And how many years were you with the van? Uh, 14. Okay. And how many times have you utilized that test that you were trained in? Uh, I've utilized this particular test thousands of times. Okay. Now, with respect to the actual process of conducting the test, can you walk us through what you do? I believe you, you indicated you swab the item. Uh, yes. So uh, prior to using this test, I'll uh, test the reagents on a known, known blood source in the van. Uh, we use uh, horse blood or pig blood. And uh, then for each suspected blood stain, uh, I'll go ahead and take a swab of the, uh, of the suspected material. In this case, I took it from uh, inside the cardboard tube, uh, put a little bit on the Q-tip, treated it with one drop of phenolphthalein, waited a second or two, then I uh, put a drop of the hydrogen peroxide on it. Does the um, swabbing of the actual item damage or alter the item itself? No, it does not. Now, you mentioned you did a, I guess, a control with uh, animal blood or horse blood. Yes. Uh, from the, do you keep that in the van? Yes, we do. Okay, why do you do that? Uh, it validates the test. Uh, it ensures that the reagents are working properly. Do you do that every time you use that same reagent? Uh, at the beginning of processing, yes. Okay. And if you were to open a new reagent, would you test it first? Yes. Okay. And did you do that test here on this day, on May 25th, 2019? Yes. 
Okay. Now, um, if it, it changes color, what color does it change into? It changes a bright pink. And what are the uh, results? What does it mean when it changes a bright pink? It's a, uh, it's a presumptive blood test. It just tells us that uh, the material is presumably blood, but it doesn't tell us whether or not it's human blood or animal blood. Uh, we will get a positive test result on any blood. Uh, Your Honor, I'm going to object now. This goes into scientific uh, testimony, and his opinion as to the conclusion of what it shows is not based on his training or his uh, scientific acumen. Well, the response was, is a presumptive test and that the presumptive test is not, as the court understands the testimony, limited to human hemoglobin. And so the objection is overruled. Is it conclusory in any way? No. Uh, um, further testing needs to be done by the uh, forensic lab. If I just may have one moment, Your Honor. And it, did you conduct that test on uh, Exhibit 13, the paper towel swabbing that you did? Yes, I did. And what was the result? It was, the test was positive. Actually, I should ask you this, sir, if I can. Um, with respect to the kitchen area of 69 Wells, uh, did you seize anything else in that area? Uh, yes. What did you seize? Uh, I found a, uh, another blood-like stain on uh, the faucet. And are, is that the kitchen faucet? The kitchen faucet on that center island. I'm actually going to draw your attention, sir, to the screen behind you, uh, States 9, File 3, Picture 10. Um, if you can, just explain what's depicted in that photograph. This is the, uh, the kitchen sink faucet on that island in the kitchen. And what you see there, uh, marked by a uh, adhesive label, marked uh, Exhibit 79, is the location of a... Uh, uh, dilute blood-like stain. If you can, could you please, uh, Your Honor, may I yes. ask him? Sir, if you could approach the screen, please, and just point out to where you're addressing. It's right in this area. Okay, lower right-hand corner. I'm actually going to scroll in. If you can, sir, uh, what, there's a white, I guess, ruler marking there. Did you put that there? Uh, yes. And EX79, what does that mean? Uh, that's just our uh, designation, and it's going to be State Police Exhibit 79. And the marking that drew your attention, is that located on the screen with a zoomed in? Uh, this area here, ma'am? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. And what did you do, if anything, with respect to that area? Uh, this area was field tested, again, using that Castlemeyer test. Um, and the area was marked. This uh, is an exhibit, and then I later uh, uh, collected a sample of this uh, stain with two swabs that were moistened with uh, sterile water. Okay, a couple of questions on that. Are you tested it utilizing the same procedure that you just testified to? Yes, it's always the same procedure. Okay. Uh, did you wear gloves while you did so? Yes. And any other protective gear? Uh, just love. Okay. Now, with respect to the uh, Castle Fire, can I, can I call it KM? Yes. Is that okay? With respect to the KM test, uh, did what was the result? Uh, the test was positive. And you indicated you took two swabbings. Was that after the test or before? Uh, after the test. Okay. And why two? Uh, we take two swabbings just for more sample, to collect more sample. With respect to this uh, this kitchen sink area, did you take any more samples or see anything on the sink faucet? Uh, yes, up in this area here, uh, we found another dilute blood stain. 
Picture 11? Yes. If you can, sir, uh, could you please point out where and what you see in that photograph? Yes, this is the, uh, the loop blood like stain uh, we found. What did you do with anything? Again, the, the area was uh, initially field tested uh, using that KM test uh, to test uh, yield a positive result. Could, could I just have a, a continuing objection so I don't have to keep interrupting on this issue with uh, regard to the presumptive? Thank you. Thank you. Overruled. And uh, following the test, uh, I marked it as Exhibit 14 and later collected it and did that same process of uh, utilizing two swabs. And with respect to the kitchen, sir, anything else in the kitchen area? Yes. Uh, they're down below in the uh, cabinet underneath the sink. We found some items of interest. It states uh, nine, picture 12. What does that depict? This depicts, uh, looks like exhibit uh, 15, uh, which was a blood like stain that we found on the handle. Sir, if I scroll in there, um, do you see if you could point out? Or is that blood like stain shown on that? Yes, it's this area here. What did you do, if anything? Uh, again, it was field tested with a KM uh, a positive test result. It was marked, uh, photographed, and collected with that same uh, two swab process. And it says EX15. What does that mean? Uh, State Police Exhibit 15. Now inside, I see a yellow, there's a yellow placard, 17. What does that mean? Um, we found two items of interest in there, actually. inside the cabinet. Um, if I can, I'm gonna go back one, actually, if I can. Sure. Uh, just have a, oops. I'll just show you 14. If I can, states nine, uh, picture 14, please, in file three. Um, if you can explain what that photograph depicts, please. Uh, the two items of interest, uh, that we collected from underneath the sink were exhibit 16, which was a uh, pair of latex gloves, and exhibit 17, which was a box of uh, white plastic trash bags. Did you make the decision to see 16? Yes. Why? Uh, the gloves had a texture to them, uh, the dishwashing gloves, and I uh, Previously, on our walkthrough, we found a uh, blood-like stain pattern in the garage on the floor that appeared to be uh, a blow, uh, blow print. And the print appeared to have some sort of texture to it that was uh, somewhat similar to these gloves here. And the 16, is that, what does that delineate? Uh, again, State Police Exhibit 16. And 17? Uh, 17 is the uh, box of uh, hefty trash bags. Did you make the decision to seize those, sir? Yes. Why? Just because we found uh, what appeared to be evidence of cleanup inside the garage. So, uh, it was, you know, we assumed that possibly one of these trash bags uh, may have been used. And if found, maybe they could match it back to uh, that box. What day did you collect this evidence? This was collected on uh, May 25th of 2019. Thank you. Um, anything else in the kitchen that you uh, seized or swapped that day? We found a, uh, another blood-like stain up um, on the edge of the uh, countertop. And states 15. <coughs> What does that depict, sir? Uh, again, that's the uh, this blood light stain here. That's the coloration. And what did you do, if anything? Uh, we field tested it for blood using that KM test. Uh, it was positive, and then we collected it using that uh, same swabbing method. Two swabs as well. So two swabs. Okay. I want to show you what's marked the states sixteen. Uh, I'm sorry, it's actually states nine, file three states, picture 16. Um, what is that? 
this is a toothbrush that I found in the master bathroom upstairs on the second floor. And there is a yellow placard 31. What does that mean? Uh, we see that as uh, State Police Exhibit 31. Why did you seize the toothbrush? In a uh, missing person investigation, uh, we attempt to collect a pseudonym uh, or something that a pseudonym DNA profile can be developed from. Uh, we do this by either collecting uh, the missing person's uh, toothbrush or razor, something, something of that nature. By missing person, do you mean Jennifer Farber Duos? Yes, ma'am, Jennifer Duos. Oh. <clears throat> On May 25th, 2019, did you collect anything else from the house? Um, yes, yeah, several, several other items. Um, you can have a seat, sir. Actually, I'm sorry. <coughs> I'm going to show you what's been marked as 17. Uh, actually, it's nine file three picture 17 what is that that is a uh, hair that we found on the garage floor now you indicated you did not process the garage on 525 um did you take this out of the garage on 525 yes i did okay why this item uh because um the hair was loose and it could have easily uh blown away if i can i'm just gonna scroll up is the hair depicted in that photograph? Yes. Now, with respect to, actually, I apologize, strike that. And I'm gonna show you what's marked as picture 18. What is that photograph? That is one of the seals that we use to uh, uh, seal up the house at the conclusion of processing on the 25th. Uh, that is on the, appears to be the central garage bay. That red tape that's depicted in the center part of the photograph, um, did you put that anywhere else on the house? Uh, yes, on the, uh, on the uh, garage bay doors and the front door and Do you recall any other ones? Not off the top of my head, ma'am. Okay. Um, with respect to uh, oh yes actually uh right above the red tape right that the gray marking what is that that's a uh garage door remote okay and did you take any action with respect to that uh yes on the 25th i uh swabbed that uh in an attempt to collect any latent uh DNA material that may have been on it. Okay, did you use that same two swap process? Uh, yes. Thank you. Now, on the 25th, uh, did you, um, again, why didn't you process the, scene, the garage on the 25th? Um, our initial, our, our plan was to call in a uh, blood stain expert. Uh, to uh, come in uh, to uh, process the garage with us. And who did you call? Uh, it was then Lieutenant Mark Davison. Okay. And what day was he scheduled to process the scene with you? Objection irrelevant with this witness. Well, and the question is: the question is, on what day was he scheduled to process the scene? And the objection is relevant. Overruled. Uh, he was scheduled uh, to uh, come on the 27th, which was Monday. Now, did you go anywhere else on May 25th? Uh, yes, I did. Where did you go? In the morning, I went to uh, Lapham Road in New Canaan. Mm I'm going to have you take a look behind you. Uh, this would be States 9, File 5, Photograph 1. Uh, do you recognize what's depicted on that photograph? Yes. What is it? That's an uh, overhead view of uh, the area of Lapham Road that I visited on the morning of the 25th. 
If you could, would you mind standing up and just pointing to the area that you visited that morning? Is uh, journaling this area here. Okay. Why? Why did you go there? You can have a seat, sir. Well, uh, before you proceed, Council, would you just indicate for the record what quadrant of the photograph oh, the I, witness pointed to? I apologize, Your Honor. For the record, that would be the middle to lower center right um, area. Is that correct, sir? Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Now, why did you respond there? Uh, we learned that the New Canaan Police Department had uh, located uh, Jennifer Dulos's uh, Chevy Suburban uh, on that road, and that they were uh, they were going to be in the process of towing it back to their police department. Uh, we wanted to go there first to take a look at the outside of it, photograph it, uh, before it was uh, loaded onto the tow truck. What time did you go to Lapham Road that day? It was in the morning, approximately 7 o'clock. What did you do when you arrived on scene? Um, I looked at the, uh, the outside of the vehicle um, and then uh, photographed uh, four sides of it. Did you walk around the entire vehicle? Uh, I believe so, yes. And with respect to, uh, well, if I can, I'm going to show you, you can take a look behind you. This is again file five, this leads nine. Uh, picture two, do you recognize that photograph? Yes. What is it? That's uh, the photograph of the Chevy Suburban I was uh, speaking about. Okay. Did you take that photograph? Yes. Now, with respect to walking around the vehicle, um, how close was it to the, I guess, foliage and, and trees next to it? Uh, I believe the, the right-hand side of the vehicle was right up against the uh, bushes. And the right-hand side, would that be the driver's or the passenger side? I'm sorry, the uh, passenger side. Thank you. And. The direction of the vehicle um, parked, I guess, is that, uh, actually, if I can just go back briefly to uh, picture one. Sir, do you know what road is on the bottom here going from left to right? Uh, that's the Mirror Parkway, uh, okay. Route 15. And with respect to the vehicle, how it was parked, did, do you know which direction it was facing? Was it towards or away from the Merit Parkway? It was facing the Merit. Now I'll show you picture three. Uh, what does that depict? That's the uh, left or driver's side of the vehicle. And picture four. That's the rear of the vehicle. Now, were you able to walk around the vehicle over here on the right side? You can see my cursor. Uh, <coughs> not completely. Um, I really just kind of had to look from you know where I could access. And did you find anything uh, on that vehicle that you took note of? I, I found some uh, blood-like stains on the outside of the vehicle. Where? On the outside of the vehicle. Okay. And where on the outside of the vehicle? Um, I believe it was on the, uh, the rear bumper. Did you photograph them? Yes, I did. Or it, I should say. I'm sorry. Five. See, it's five. What is that? That's uh, one of the blood-like stains. I found on the vehicle. Now, if I scroll in, it does not have, this photograph doesn't have a writing here. Um, did you put that white, I guess, measurement marker that we've seen? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, you, there's nothing written on it. Is there a reason why? I just uh, included in the photograph for scale. Uh, did you uh, process or take any action with the vehicle as it remained on scene? Uh, no. And what is six to pick, please? Again, that's another view of that, that same stain. Okay. Thank you. Now, sir, I'm going to draw your attention back to May 27th. Uh, well, actually, before I go there, I'm sorry, I strike that. Uh, the evidence that you collected on May 25th, I think we went through some of them, the swabbings, the 13 through... I forget the number now. Uh, what did, what happened to the evidence after you packaged it and gave it a evidence number? Um, the evidence was sealed, and I uh, labeled them appropriately uh, per our uh, protocol. Uh, some of the electronic evidence 
that was turned over to the New Canaan Police Department so they could uh, pursue those uh, those items, examine those. With respect to the items that we that you were shown photographs of, what yes. happened to those? Um, I secured those in the uh, major crime van. And at the conclusion of processing, I drove those up to uh, our headquarters in Litchfield, uh, secured them in the evidence room. And then um, on the 27th in the morning, I returned to Litchfield, took them out of the evidence room, put them on the uh, major crime van, and drove them back down to New Canaan. At Why the, did you do that? Um, because they were still in our custody. Okay. And was it a state police case at this point? Uh, I'm not sure when that changed, ma'am. Uh, all I and we just wanted to, we wanted to keep the evidence together. And normally, um, we turn over evidence to the local police departments when we do do an assist all at once. Okay. And on the 27th, uh, did you drive the van to 69 Wells that day? Yes. And in the van, is there a place to store the evidence? Uh, we usually keep it in a banker's box on the floor. And when you arrived at 69 Wells Lane on May 27th, uh, who was there? Um, a lot of the same crew from uh, the 25th was there uh, with the addition of Detective uh, Jamie Pearson and uh, uh, Lieutenant Mark Davison. And between 525 and, well, like that, they can't. Eat. That photograph we showed you with the red tape yes. on the doors uh, was that in the same location when you arrived back on 527? Yes. Was anyone from New Canaan Police Department on scene on 527? They had posted a uh, uniformed officer in the driveway. Did you see anybody from New Canaan Police Department go into the residence with you that day or not with you? Did you just see them? Uh, yeah, they, they were just in the driveway, ma'am. Um, did they enter the garage? Uh, not while we were processing it. Now, um, on May 27th, did you process any other area other than the garage? Um, yes. Uh, we, again, continued to look through uh, the rest of the house. Uh, in addition to the garage, we also did a latent print exam uh, in various areas of the house. Did you do that before you process the garage or after? It was, uh, it was, it was pretty much ongoing. Uh, however, the latent print exam was probably one of the last things we did. Why do you do that as part of the last things you do? Because uh, we use standard fingerprint powders and it really makes a mess. Was in the processing of the garage, was the garage, um, I guess, divided up? Uh, yes, we came up with a grid system uh, just to make documentation easier. Uh, we laid out a, a grid with um, uh, yellow tape, similar to masking tape, that has uh, measurements on it. And we, uh, we gave them letter designations, A, B, C, D, all the way up to G. You mentioned uh, Detective Pearson was present with you on 527. What was her assignment? Her assignment was to uh, create a sketch map of the garage. Have you reviewed those sketch maps, sir? Yes. Okay. I'm going to draw your attention to the screen behind you. I am in States 9, file 6. And actually, if I may. Do you recognize what's depicted on the screen behind you, sir? Yes, that is one of the uh, finished maps that Detective Pearson uh, created. Did you have a particular process or procedure you um, conducted throughout the garage that day? Um, the, the garage was uh, examined, um, you know, for evidence along with um, the documentation done by Lieutenant Davison. Uh, we kind of uh, worked it together. 
Now, I'm going to ask you a couple questions starting with garage A, marked A, if I can. Do you recognize the um, map behind you, sir? Yes. Okay. Uh, with respect to the uh, letters and numbers that are uh, printed inside of A, for instance, A18, A17, A16, what exactly are, are those supposed to designate? Uh, those numbers are for uh, individual stains that Lieutenant Davison uh, designated uh, for his uh, examination. Um, and the EX numbers or the EX letters? Right. So um, those were samples that I took for uh, DNA identification purposes. So uh, uh, Lieutenant Davison was... Uh, examining the uh, blood stain patterns. And in his examination, the uh, selected stains gave them those letter designations. And from each stain pattern, I chose one and collected it. Why did you only choose one? Uh, really, it's just to get a uh, uh, representative uh, DNA, DNA profile from that uh, stain pattern or region of the garage. And as you say, um, you chose one. What did you do? I mean, if you could walk us through the process briefly. Uh, using the same uh, method that I used on the previous uh, blood-like stains, I uh, field tested it with uh, a KM uh, test. Um, you know, uh, noted that, whether it was positive or negative, and then using that two-swab uh, two process, with uh, swabs moistened with sterile water, I collected uh, the stains. Okay. I can just have a moment. Just a couple questions, if I can. If you can take a look behind you. Uh, showing the map on the left, but on the right side, it's photograph two out of file six on states nine. Um, what does that depict? Um, that depicts the photograph, an overall photograph of area A and uh, corresponding overhead view on the sketch map of area A. Was that prior to processing? Uh, this was in the process. Um, this was the beginning of that examination. Oh. And <coughs> I can, I'm actually going to bring that back down. To... Okay. Uh, picture three of that same file. Sir, what does that depict? Um, again, that's just another view of area A. If I can, just draw your attention and ask you some questions about these. There's a sort of like an upside down L shaped file. What is that there for? Uh, that's to help uh, give scale to uh, my approach to the if screen. You can. Thank you. Um, So you can see this uh, discoloration here um, that appeared to us to be uh, a white mark um, where uh, maybe some blood-like material was on the floor and it, uh, there was an attempt made to wipe it up. Can't hear. I'm sorry, sir. If you can, just move that microphone behind <coughs> you, maybe up a little. It's behind you. Oh. The one. Thank you. And the yellow arrow up on the upper middle part of that photograph, what does that depict? Um, that's usually placed by the photographer to uh, denote north. So it's directional? It's directional, correct. And this yellow uh, marking, is that the yellow marking you were talking about that, before? Correct, that's that yellow mask that Jake was uh, talking about. Okay. Now, with respect to these three items, Did you put those down? Uh, no, I did not. Okay. And 
Over here on the right hand side, we have that same, I guess, uh, ruler marking. Uh, what does that depict? That's uh, that same L scale is being used to denote another uh, stain pattern uh, found on the on the garage floor. And is that? Wall. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, is that for documentation? Yes. Now, with respect to the rest of the the garage floor, there's these little dots here all over. I'm gonna push the photograph up if I can. All these little markings. What are those? Um, I mean, that's it's a garage floor. So you have plant material, you have, uh, you know, other other types of vegetation, you have uh, sand, road salt. Um, now, I'm going to show you picture four, sir, in that same file. What is this? Uh, this is part of uh, Lieutenant uh, Davison's uh, examination of the garage floor. Uh, were you present when these markers were placed down? When they were placed down, no. But I was, uh, I, I observed these in place. And just to, and what do they read, please? Uh, they read A12, A13, A14, and A15 with my marking of uh, State Police Exhibit 40. And this is, is this corresponding on the, on the map on the left-hand side of the screen? Yes, uh, in this area here. Okay, and with respect to States 40, uh, did you utilize that same uh, two swab process in swabbing it? It's the same process. It's uh, first uh, KM tested and then collected with the two swabs. And the KM test? Uh, was positive. And just to clarify, this is a, which one is the, what is this depicted? That is a uh, stained A12. Okay, if you can, so I'm just gonna show you a series of photographs. If you can just point to the sketch map to show, correspond where they are located. Sure. If you can, A12. thank you. Now state six. A13. State seven. A14. And state eight. It's A15, where uh, exhibit 40 was sampled. And is that the area that you swapped that day, sir? Yes. Thank you. That's state nine. With respect to these areas, uh, do you, did you mark these? or delineate these in any way? I did not place those scales. Now, with respect to this area, uh, if you could tell me what this is. Uh, this is a uh, photograph uh, taken overhead of uh, stains denoted as A16, 17, and 18, along with uh, exhibit 41, which is in this area here. Um, now, just briefly, if I can, I just want to be clear, with respect to A16, 17, and 18, uh, do you recall uh, viewing those that yes. day? Okay. And you took a swabbing off of which one? Off of uh, stain A18. Okay, which is up here, right? Correct. Who took the photographs that day? Uh, I... It was uh, Detective uh, Kate Keppel and Detective Bob Hazen. If you can, sir, same question, series of photographs, if you can just point to the screen where. This is uh, stain A16, A17, and A18. Do you recall, by the way, this is kind of leaning I guess angled one way, and then I'm going to draw your attention to the preceding two photographs, 17 and 16. Actually, I'm sorry, it's photographs 12 and 13, but A16 and A17. They're leaning the other way for the photographs, and the overview has them this way. My question is just, which way are they supposed to be? 
the, the scales were not moved, if that makes things easier. Uh, the photographer was probably just standing on one side of the stain or the other. In the course of the photography and processing scene, did the scales ever move? Uh, not, in, not on the garage floor in this case. Okay. So. And I believe we have. And actually, did you review? The part designated as garage B. <coughs> and if I can, sir, do you recognize what is depicted on the screen there? Yes, that is uh, another. Uh... Oh, I apologize. I hit the wrong. Sure. Button. There you go. And that is the uh, another part of the, the left side garage bay um, in the center of the garage. Okay. Is the photograph one on state seven, well, states nine, file seven, photograph one? Is that area depicted on the, or is I should say, the map a depiction of an area on that photograph? Uh, yes. If you could just point it out on the photograph, please. It's this area here. Uh, you can see the, uh, the B placard right there. And for the record, that was the middle portion of the photograph? The middle, correct. Okay. Now, on this, we have, on the map portion, we have the numbers ranging from B3 all the way up to B11. Um, is there a B1 or 2? Uh, that I don't know. <laughs> Um, and state picture two, uh, does that depict an area depicted in the map? Uh, yes. Okay. And states three. Yes, that's, uh, that's the right hand side of the map. States four. What is on that photograph, please? That's a, a fragment of paper towel uh, that appeared to have blood-like stains on it uh, that we found in area B, of the left-hand uh, side of the garage, and it's located right there on the sketch map. It is okay. exhibit 42. For the record, you're pointing to the middle portion of the garage. Um, question about the well, sorry, we'll draw that. Uh, with respect to the 42, that uh, paper towel, uh, there's a, can I ask you to describe some of the, I guess, dots that are contained in the 42? Uh, what exactly did that appear to be to you? Um, oh, um, yes, this material here appears to be uh, plant-like, uh, maybe part of seeds or did you take any swabbings of 42? Uh, I did not. Why not? Um, because I just seized the entire uh, fragment of paper towel. How did you seize it? I put it uh, in either a, a paper bag or a paper envelope. Did you seize anything else out of that area B? Uh, yes. <clears throat> what did you seize? Um, there were two uh, stains. Uh, B3, I took a sample of this is exhibit 38. B11, um, I took uh, swabbings as exhibit 39. And uh, exhibit 43, which I believe was another uh, paper towel fragment. Picture five, uh, what does that depict, sir? I, that's uh, another paper towel, it's a larger paper towel fragment uh, with apparent blood like stains. Kind of see this, this reddish staining here. What did you do, if anything, with the 43? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I just uh, sure it was photographed, uh, sketched into the map, and I seized in a similar manner as uh, 42. 
Did you take any swabbings? I did not. And if you can, sir, uh, is what's on picture six uh, depicted on the map as well? Uh, this was the stain uh, designated as B3 that I took uh, swabbings uh, of as exhibit 38. And did you do any testing on exhibit 38 as well? Uh, I did. I did a, a KM test. And the results? Uh, positive. Mm -hmm. Now, what does this depict, sir? That is uh, stain B4, located there. And for same questions for the next couple, if you wouldn't mind just pointing out where it appears on the map uh, corresponding with the picture. So picture eight, B5. Uh, B5 is here. Picture nine, B6. Uh, B6. Picture 10, B7 and B8. B7, B8. Picture 11, B9. B9. Um, picture 12, uh, what does that show, sir? So that is uh, stains B9, B10, and B11, I which are up in this area here. A sample of B11 I swapped as uh, exhibit 39. And that is, if you. Okay, and the same swabbing process, same every? Same swabbing process that was also tested with the uh, decaying of test that was positive. You know, picture 13, what is that, sir? That is, appears to be one of those uh, blood-like stains, that swipe mark that we saw up in area A. And is this depicted on the map in any way? Uh, I don't believe so. Was that contained in area B at all? Um, without seeing a, an overall shot, I really can say that. Okay, let me see if I can. Here's the overview. Uh, does picture one assist you in any way? And if, you, if it doesn't, that, it, you could just say that to It's hard you. to say, ma'am. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you if I can about the bottom part of that garage side. If you could take a look. Are you familiar with Detective Pearson's map for C? Yes, this is the uh, portion of that left garage bay uh, closest to the door. And for the record, I'm going to see it's nine. I am now in file eight. Picture one, what does that depict, sir? Uh, that uh, depicts that left garage bay. And area C is in um, kind of the closest to the driveway. It's this area here. Okay. And for the record, it's pointing towards the middle bottom portion of the photograph. Picture two, um, what is that a picture of, sir? Those are uh, some more of the blood like uh, stains we found on the garage floor. <coughs> And the yellow arrow again? Again, the note snort. Okay. Picture three. Um, what does that depict, sir? That is uh, area C with some of the stains and uh, exhibits marked up. We have the um, 68 placard right here. What is that supposed to designate? That designates uh, another fragment of a uh, paper towel. I can just. Is that depicted on the photograph? Yes. What did you do, if anything, with uh, 68, please? I collected it in uh, <coughs> the same manner as the other fragments of paper towel. It was uh, packaged in uh, paper. Did you take any swabbings? I did not. And if you can, 
insert uh, picture four. And if you wouldn't mind the same thing, just so if it is reflected on the map on the left side, if Hold you could. Hold on, stop, please. Oh. <coughs> what has just happened, ladies and gentlemen, is that, of course, the entire proceeding is recorded. The recording system just went down. So what we would ask you to do is just to turn to the deliberation room. Please do not discuss the case. We're going to take our morning recess until eleven thirty. Eleven thirty, Mr. Marshall. All right.
Yes, Madam sir. Monica, do we know what happened? We do not know, Your Honor, um, but we were able to rectify whatever that problem was. Thank you. We can bring the jury in, please. Does Your Honor wish me to get Detective Riley outside? We can call him back in. And, and before the jury comes out, I just wanted to add to my um, comments about the the use of the nasatol since we haven't got to the pictures yet. One of the things the court hadn't well, ruled Well, the jury's out. going to file out while you speak. Oh, there's no witness. Got it. Counsel stipulated to the presence of all of the jurors. Yes, Your Honor. Yes. You may be seated. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective Riley, if you wouldn't mind taking a stand next to the TV again. And just to back up a few of my questions. Um, with respect to states nine file eight picture four, I believe, uh, if you could, could you just, is what's can shown in that photograph on the map on the left-hand side? Um, yes, with the exception of uh, the state mark 220. What area is that seen? attributed to uh area g and so the yellow numbered ruler in the i guess the middle portion of the photograph it would be this line here in the left okay picture five action as uh stain c0 now with respect to the way the photograph is is that how it's depicted on the map if i can i would go back to states four and draw your attention to line again. Where is C0 on states four? Uh, it's here in the uh, center of the photograph. Please, the mic. Oh, if you can. Yep, it's in the uh, center of the photograph. Thank you. And this is picture five again. Picture six, if you could just identify that in the map as well. Uh, stain C1. And picture seven. Uh, stain C2 uh, in the center of the sketch map from which uh, I see is exhibit 37. Uh, same process as you indicated before with the swabbing? Same testing and swabbing process, correct. And the test results? Uh, positive. Thank you. <clears throat> now, Picture eight, sir, what does that depict? Uh, picture eight depicts the uh, interior face of the left garage bay door. If I can. Did you seize anything for evidentiary value on the garage bay door? Yes, I uh, seized a sample of a blood like stain it's on the inside of the garage door. States nine. Actually, I'm sorry, if I can go back to states eight. Where on the door, if you could please point, uh, did you seize that item? Uh, it's in the center of the photograph, slightly to the left hand side. Okay. For the record, he's pointing to the middle, essentially the middle left of the screen. And states nine. What does that depict, sir? That is uh, the stain, a uh, sample of which I seized is exhibit 67. And the same process? Same swabbing process, same testing process. Uh, and the results? Uh, the test was positive. Did you uh, process the right side of the garage in the? In the yes. Are you familiar with Detective Pearson's map for Zone G? 
I mean, I'm sorry, G D. Uh, area D. Area D. Yes, thank you. For the record, this would be states nine, file nine. Photograph two, actually. Do you recognize what that is, sir? Yes, this is a overall photograph of area D, the right hand bay of the garage. Uh, out of frame to the left would be the mudroom door. Uh, give you a little uh, orientation. And are there areas below area D? Yes, you can see uh, the marker for area E and area F, which would be by the, uh, the overhead door. I'll show you states one out of that file. What does that show, sir? That's uh, overall the uh, right hand uh, garage bag with area D at the top of the photograph, um, area E in the middle, and area F at the bottom. States three, or picture three, I should say. Um, what does that picture depict? That is a photo of a uh, blood like stain we found in area D. And the 56, what does that mean? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I designated this as uh, State Police Exhibit 56. However, um, it's the photograph. Um, the exhibit is going to be uh, the photograph of what we uh, thought was a uh, footwear impression or a shoe print. Uh, if I can, sir, uh, just a couple questions. Is that depicted, exhibit 56 depicted <coughs> on zone D map? Yes, uh, exhibit 56 is in the approximate center. Okay, and with respect to photograph three, if you can, I'm gonna scroll in. What uh, drew your attention to this area? <clears throat> well, it's, a, uh, it's another blood like stain on the garage floor, and there was a distinctive pattern to it. Oh, could you see the pattern in that photograph? Or yes. I... Here, I'll scroll it up. It appears to be, uh, you can see these hash marks here. And for the record, you, I would say the middle part of the photograph? Yes. Picture four, what does that depict, sir? Uh, again, that's a uh, stain pattern uh, located here in area B of an apparent footwear impression. And if you could just point to where that appears on the picture four. It's here in the uh, center of the photograph. Picture six. Uh, it's a, uh, another stain pattern. And where does that depict on the map? Uh, exhibit seven. And if you could please, um, picture six, show point to what you are describing, please. In the uh, kind of the lower portion, the center of the photograph. Okay. I'm actually going to scroll in a little. Oops, sorry. If I can go back to seven day. Um, with respect to uh, exhibit 70, when you you were pointing, if you could point to the area now that it takes over the whole screen, what you were um, describing. Sure, it's a uh, it's a blood like stain on the garage floor, and you can see a, a partial distinctive pattern uh, within the stain itself. How did you um, did you place that 7D marker on there? I did, yes. Okay. How do you document this or seize this as an exhibit? Well, uh, the hard way would be to jackhammer up the floor and send that to the lab, but that's not too practical. Uh, so, what we decided to do is photograph them uh, properly, 90 degrees, with scale and send the photographs to the lab as Exhibit 70 for uh, identification and uh, possible comparison. 
Thank you. And 71, is that depicted on zone D map as well? Uh, yes, it is exhibit 71 here. And why did you seize that item, sir? <clears throat> Again, this is another uh, blood like stain on the garage floor. You can see uh, you know, that uh, a similar pattern in it, but you can also see uh, the swipe marks through it. Picture eight, uh, what does this show, sir? Uh, picture eight is, uh, it's another uh, area of blood-like staining that appear to be uh, white marks. And was this all contained in area D? Yes. And picture nine? Yeah, it's the uh, additional stain pattern uh, found in area E. If I can, I'm gonna scroll. Oops. Up here, this um, marker, I guess L-shaped marker again. Uh, what is that? Again, it's another blood-like stain on the floor uh, with uh, a similar pattern, but uh, a lot less detail to it. And with respect to these, items just around and if you can follow my cursor cursor sir they're little dots or things what are they uh it's pretty be uh, uh vegetative matter plants and um anything actually picture 10 uh was this contained in area d uh yes Right here at the uh, almost at the border of area D. E. And is this the the um, same item that you seized on five twenty five? This is correct. This is the uh, error. Now, with respect to states nine file ten. So, are you familiar with Detective Pearson's? Map for area E. Yes. Um, sir, uh, photograph one out of that file. Uh, what does that depict? It's an overall view of uh, again that right uh, side garage bay. Area E is depicted uh, here, right in the center. Photograph two. What is that, sir? Uh, this is a blood-like stain pattern that um, we located in area E. It's located uh, here, kind of top center of the area. And um, I took a swabbing of this uh, area uh, to, to sample the uh, blood-like stain that was on the garage floor. Was that designated as a exhibit? Yes, Exhibit 51. There is a pink arrow on the right side. Do you see where the pink arrow is? Yes. What exactly is that? Uh, that in this large stain pattern, the arrow uh, depicts exactly where I took the sample from. And same process, two swaps? Uh, two swaps, yes. Uh, did you test it? I did. And the results? Uh, again, I mean, it's Every now and then, just make the same objection regarding any quote results. Thank you. Overruled. Uh, the test result was positive. Thank you, sir. Picture three. Um, as a similar stain pattern, um, another uh, blood-like stain appeared to be a white. It's located here at um, the left-hand side of area E. And again, I sampled this using that same swapping technique, same testing technique, uh, and I took the sample from this area here. And the test results? Uh, test results were positive. Picture four? Picture four is another uh, blood-like stain found in area E. Uh, and the stain pattern itself uh, appeared to us to be a uh, textured glove. <clears throat> if uh, you can imagine uh, three fingers here. 
So what exhibit was this marked up? I marked it as State Police Exhibit 55. Thank you. And State's 5. What does that show? Uh, that's an overall view of Area E taken from um, kind of with your back to the mudroom door. So you can see uh, exhibit 55 here, that uh, swipe mark. And picture six. It's an off kilter view of uh, Area E and the right hand side of the garage. Thank you. I'm going to draw your attention now to States 9, file 11. Are you familiar with Detective Pearson's map concerning zone F? Yes, I am. Picture one off of states nine, file 11. Sir, what does that depict? It's an overall view of the right hand side of the garage. You can see area F is down here. This is the uh, kind of threshold of the overhead door. And area F is up in this area. Uh, takes up uh, center all the way down to the bottom of the photograph. Thank you. Picture two. It's uh, another uh, flood-like stain pattern we found on the uh, garage floor. Again, this is the threshold of the overhead door. Actually, I'm going to scroll in a little bit. So that yellow arrow again, what does that depict? That uh, denotes north. Picture three. That is, uh, again, another uh, floor-like stain pattern we found on the floor. Again, there's uh, more detail inside this pattern. So we designated it as State Police Exhibit 54, photographed it in a similar manner as the others. And is that depicted on the um, map? Yes, it's located on the left-hand side of area F. Picture four. Picture four is a, uh, another glow like stain pattern found on the floor. And picture five? That is a uh, uh, blood like stain that I uh, tested and sampled as exhibit 52. And with respect to the swabbing process, same swabbing process? S correct, same testing and swabbing process. And the test results of this one? Uh, um, I refer to my uh, report. Would it refresh your recollection to take a look at your exhibit report? Yes. Your recollection take a look at your exhibit report? Yes, it would. I'm going to hand you and draw your attention, please, to page three. Um, please take a moment, do not read that out loud, and look up to me when you're done. Did that sufficiently refresh your recollection, sir, as to uh, the results of the test? Yes, it did. And what were the results of the test? That KM test was negative. Thank you. And is that depicted on the map as well? Yes. Exhibit 52 is there. Thank you. And state six, or picture six, I should say. What is that? Yeah, that's a, uh, another overall view of area F.
Are you familiar with area G, sir? Yes. Okay. And now states nine, file 12. Are you familiar with uh, Detective Pearson's map? Yes, I am. Uh, photograph one, sir, what does that depict? That is a photograph of the center garage bay, 69 Wells. And is area G contained in that photograph? Area G is in the area uh, in which the uh, Range Rover is parked. So it's in this area here. Photograph two. Uh, photograph two are some uh, blood like stains found in area G up in this area. And for orientation, this is the step into the uh, mud room. Now, what are the, uh, were exhibit numbers given to each of these stains? Uh, the stains that I sampled, yes. Okay. With respect to exhibit or states picture three, uh, what is that, sir? Uh, that is a stain we sampled as uh, Exhibit 47. Is that reflected on the map? Yes. And when you say sample, uh, did you conduct the swabbing process that you I, testified to earlier? I did. And the test, any test? Uh, I did test that. Uh, and there were some stains up in this area that tested negative. And just from this, I... Uh, I don't remember which ones were which. Would it refresh your recollection? Take a look at your exhibit report again. Yes. If I may. I'm going to draw your attention to page two of your exhibit report. If you could please just take a look. Sir, did that refresh your recollection? Yes. And with respect to the presumptive test that was performed on exhibit 47, do you recall what the results were? Uh, the KM test was negative for this thing. Okay. And 48? Uh, 48 was a, another blood like stain in the same general area. It's right here by the stairs. Uh, again, I sampled that. And tested it and sampled it in a similar manner. And the results of that one? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure of either. If I can, um, if I may just have a moment. If I can, I'm just going to provide counsel, uh, provide Detective Riley with um, 11A, or I'm sorry, 11 for ID, which is the exhibit report. Sir, if you can just take a minute and take a look at that, if you can, um, to refresh your recollection with, result, with respect to the results of any testing performed on exhibit 48 on 527. Yeah, the, K, the KM test for exhibit 48 was positive. 49. Uh, 49, another blood like stain uh, located up here in the same general area. It was uh, tested and swabbed, collected in uh, the same manner as the others. And, and the test result for this stain was negative. And picture six. Uh, again, another uh, blood like stain on the garage floor. Uh, located here, I sampled it, uh, tested and sampled it in, a, in the same manner, with the uh, and the test result was negative. Picture seven. Uh, picture seven is a fragment of paper towel found under the left front tire of the Range Rover. See it. Uh, it's located here. 
Did you take any action with respect to that? Um, after it was photographed, I just collected it then. Picture eight. Uh, is a photo of a blood like stain. Uh, again, it appears to be a swipe located in area, uh, area G, a sample of which was seized as Exhibit 45. It was uh, tested and collected in the same manner. Do you recall the results? Uh, the test result for this stain was positive. Picture nine. That is a stain pattern. Uh, it was uh, designated G20 for a blood like stain, uh, a sample of which I see is this exhibit 36. I tested it and swabbed it, collected it in the same manner, and the test result for this was positive. Picture 10. As uh, the stain marked as G19. Uh, located in area G that I tested, swabbed, and collected in the same manner. The okay, and test result for this was positive. Picture 11. Uh, that's the, uh, this is a picture of the stain pattern found in area G after, I'm sorry, two stain patterns found in area G. And this photograph was taken after Range Rover was removed. Okay. Actually, I'm going to go down to <coughs> and what does this photograph depict? Sir, so states 18. Uh, this was a photograph that um, belonged to the process of Lieutenant Davison's examination of the uh, blood like stains on the floor. And <coughs> if I may just have a moment, Your Honor. Yes. Confirm the counsel. <coughs> Objection to it if I may just have a moment to switch it out. Yes. No objection. Attorney Shulman. No objection. That's correct. Stage 10 will be admitted as a full exhibit. Sir, were you present when the Range Rover was removed from the garage? Yes. And did you conduct further processing of the garage scene with the Range Rover removed? Yes. can just take a look behind you sir this is states 10 filed 16 can um, what does that depict um, <coughs> and, uh, appears to be a blue like stain uh, that, that swipe pattern uh, sample from area G <coughs> Um, we pull up the exhibit number. Uh, yes, this was uh, tested and sampled and seized as State Police Exhibit 45. And just to be clear, the same process, same everything? Yes. Okay, results? Uh, the test results for this was positive. Okay. And at some point, the Range Rover was removed. Who removed it from the garage? Uh, I believe uh, we just towed it out of the garage and uh, winched it up on a flatbed. Okay. And did you continue processing the garage floor after the vehicle was removed? Yes. Okay, I'm going to turn your attention to the photograph two. Uh, what does that depict? Uh, that depicts the uh, two stain patterns 
fifth would have been underneath the Range Rover. Uh, one here in the lower part of the photo, and one here uh, a little bit higher. Tim, just scrolling in, sir. Does that the higher one appear on the on the screen? Yes, uh, up in this area here. Okay. Now, what does picture three do? Uh, that is the uh, the selected stains that were designated as uh, GW1, GW2, GW3, GW4, and GW5. And sir, what does GW mean? Uh, area G, I'm not sure what the W stands for. Uh, that would be uh, Lieutenant Davison's. Expertise. And uh, were these the, I'm going to show you a series of photographs, please. You just indicated some numbers. Are these the ones that correspond to the numbers that you marked? Correct. Okay, that would be for the records for photo, sorry, eight, seven, six, five, six, five, and four. Are photos four through eight depicted in photo three? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, photo nine, what is that, sir? Uh, this is uh, that upper stain pattern in area G. Um, it was seen in the overall photograph. Here you have uh, stain uh, GE1, GE2, GE3, GE4, and GE5. And just briefly, if you could take a look at 10, uh, what does that depict, sir? That stain uh, designated as GE1. Could you point to the stain? Okay. And for the, the record, it's the middle of the photograph? Center of the photograph, correct. Thank you. Picture 11. This is stain GE2 in the center of the photograph. Is this oriented like this picture? Sir, if I can. Um, to... So you can see the elongated stain here. Okay. So it... The elongated stain here. Um, Which way is it on the garage floor? Is it perpendicular or I guess parallel? So if you turn this photo uh, clockwise, they would align. Okay. It was just taken from a different angle. Picture 12. Uh, stain GE3 in the center of the photograph. Stain oh, G. I apologize. Same question with respect to GE3. In... Uh, similar, the, the scales did not move. Okay. And GE4? G4, uh, again, the stain in the center of the photograph, and the scale did not move from the overall. And GE5? G5, um, similar. Mm -hmm. Is this elongated stain here? And again, it's oriented, the, the scale's in the same position in the overall photograph. Just safe to say it's the way the photograph was done? Exactly, it was just the way the frame was taken. And. Picture 15, please. Uh, 15 is a uh, photo of a stain on the garage floor. Appears to be a tire mark. Thank you. If I may, you're in the states going back to states nine.
Streets 9, file 13. Sir, what does that depict? Uh, <clears throat> these are the garbage cans that were found inside of the garage at 69 Wells. Uh, they were in the corner of the right-hand bay. Uh, the garage door would be on the right-hand side of your photograph. And did you find anything of evidentiary value on the garbage cans? Yes, there were uh, blood-like stains found uh, up and around the lids on both garbage cans. Photograph two, what is that? That is a photograph of uh, the left garbage can. And photograph three. Uh, again, uh, that appears to be the, uh, the left uh, garbage can. And you can see the blood like stains both here and there. Photograph four. That is a photograph of, I prefer my report to get left to right. If it would refresh your recollection, yes. please. That's a photograph of the uh, the left hand um, garbage can that you saw in the overall photo. Uh, this was taken during the evidence collection process, uh, and it was uh, tested, swabbed, and collected at State Police Exhibit 66 from this area here. Uh, were there other swabbings that were taken out of the garbage cans? Uh, on the uh, right hand garbage can. So that's a right hand garbage can. Again, uh, in a similar area, found a blow like stain. Okay. And with respect to um, the garbage cans, about how many stain or swabbings did you take in all of the left garbage can? Uh, if it could refresh your recollection, take a look at your report, please. Still the same, uh, two swabs. Mm -hmm. And with respect to the um, right side garbage can? Uh, two swabs. And were those also tested? Uh, yes. And the results? Uh, positive. Now, sir, did you all have an opportunity to examine the um, Chevy Suburban that you, or process, be part of the processing of the Chevy Suburban that you earlier in the day had gone to Lapham Road? So yes. You, examine? Oh, you can have a seat, sir. When was that? Uh, that was on June the 28th, so it would have been the Tuesday after Memorial Day. And actually, prior to uh, leaving 69 Wells that day on May 27th, 2019, uh, you testified earlier about late imprints. Did you conduct any late imprint um, documentation? Yes, we did. I'm actually going to go to... States 9, file 4. Where did you uh, take latent prints from? Uh, well, we, uh, we searched for latent prints uh, around the points of entry. Um, I'm going to object as non responsive. Okay. Well, the question is where did you take latent prints from? And the answer was we searched for latent prints. It is non responsive. To I will ask some foundation questions, sir. Uh, what exactly is a latent print? It's a, uh, lack of a better term, an invisible fingerprint. A fingerprint uh, that's deposited on a surface that needs some sort of development to make it visible. And is there a process that you utilize in searching for these? Yes. What is that process? Process is uh, uh, visual observation, uh, utilizing uh, side light, side lighting, different lighting techniques. And then in this case, it was the application of uh, just standard fingerprint powders. 
And how does fingerprint powder allow you to search for latent prints? Uh, the fingerprint powder is extremely fine and it adheres to the fingerprint residue and makes the print visible. And did you conduct that process at 69 Wells? <clears throat> yes. At what locations? Uh, various locations throughout the, uh, the house, the first floor, uh, and around the points of entry, around uh, the mudroom door, around that, uh, the kitchen, the kitchen island. I'm going to show you some photographs, sir, if I can. If you could take a look behind you. States 9, this is file 4. What do you see, uh, sir, depicted in that photograph? That's an overall photo of the uh, door leading into the mudroom from the garage uh, after uh, lane print processing and prior to uh, the collection of the prints. <coughs> And well, actually, I'm sorry, I went too fast. Um, if you could, would you mind standing up sure. and going back to the screen? Thank you. A couple of questions are, where is all on that photograph, if anywhere on that photograph, the, you mentioned the black powder, uh, fingerprint powder, if you could just describe it for the record, please. Right, it's all in, it's this uh, dark colored smudge is all over the, uh, the white building. Did you put that on there? Uh, yes, I was one of the, the people uh, who uh, searched for latent fingerprints with the with uh, only object is non responsive. It either he did it or it was one of the people. Well, the question was, did you do that? He said he was one of the people in the court. Understand parenthetically who did it. Overruled. What is the process for putting that fingerprint powder on, the, on a door such as this? Uh, we have special brushes that we use that we put the fingerprint powder on and apply it to uh, uh, the surface. And uh, sometimes the fingerprints readily uh, appear, uh, become visible. Sometimes it takes a little bit of work to clean up smudges and, and things like that with the brushes. And how would you do that? Uh, clean up smudges or what do you mean by that? Oh, you just, uh, if... Uh, to get more detail out of the print, you'll uh, work it with finer brushes, smaller brushes, and try and clean out uh, the fingerprint powder from in between the ridges that you see on the uh, on the print. Did you develop any latent prints out of the mudroom door? Uh, yes. Where? Uh, right here above the uh, lock cylinder. Show you what's been marked as seats. Picture two. Sir, what does that show? So this is the uh, the latent prints uh, prior to collection, prior to lifting them. And what do you mean by that? So we will take uh, we will take photographs, obviously, to uh, to try and pick up the detail, and then once that's completed, we'll go ahead and take uh, adhesive uh, lifters. Usually, there, it's uh, adhesive clear acetate, almost like tape. Uh, in this case, uh, down here, uh, we used a uh, gelatin lifter, which is uh, a, a layer, a thin layer of gelatin on a rubberized backing. Uh, it's just used for different surfaces. And the markings on the measuring tape, or the white white stickers, I should say, uh, what exactly does that mean? So uh, the LP stands for latent print. Uh, so we keep we run them sequentially. So this would be later. Your Honor, again, I'm going to object unless he's referring to himself in the plural. I would ask that he at least clarify whether he did this or someone else did it, just for clarification. Well, the question, as the court understood it, is not whether he did it. He was asked to explain what those designations mean, if the court understood it correctly. That was the state's question, Your Honor. Overruled. So uh, this is my handwriting on the markings. So uh, LP stands for latent print. Latent print seven, which is also designated as State Police Exhibit 82. Here, uh, LP eight, latent print eight, State Police Exhibit 83. Uh, did you go anywhere else in the house uh, and conduct this process? Yes. Where? Um, the, uh, the kitchen. Of the residence. 
And with respect to the mudroom door, is this the side going into the garage or the side going into the kitchen? So this is what we we designated as the exterior side. So uh, this is the garage side of that mudroom door. Picture three, uh, do you recognize what's depicted in this photograph? Yes, this is the, uh, the area around the inside face of the mudroom door. You can see down here where the, I had removed the, uh, the doorknob. So this is the, uh, one of the casings. You can see uh, LP1, late print one, exhibit 73. Above that, uh, late print two, exhibit 74. And down on the wall, uh, exhibit 75, which was late print three. The blue writing, is that actually on the wall? Yes, I did that with a, a grease pencil and China marker. Why would you do that? That designates uh, which one uh, I'm actually looking at, or uh, what the actual lift is. So um, and it just depends on the amount of detail in that print. So in a photograph, if I just put up a scale, I don't know which one of these is the exhibit. That's why we uh, you know, circle it with uh, the china marker and the arrow just uh, orients the print. And then sometimes that gets picked up on the lifter itself. So it's, for the, it's more for the examiner. Did you search for latent prints in the kitchen area? Yes, I did. Where? Uh, mainly around the kitchen aisle. Where I uh, found those other exhibits. Right. Show you what's been marked as picture four. Do you recognize what's depicted in this photograph? Yes, that's the uh, inside of uh, one of the cabinet doors. And if you can, uh, that same blue writing is on there. If you could explain that, please. Correct. That's uh, I marked out the print in blue. Uh, Blue China marker and designated it as a uh, latent print four, exhibit 76. I'll show you what's been marked as states five. Uh, what does this photograph depict, sir? That is on one of the uh, entry doors. Um, may I refer to my report to? If it would refresh your recollection, Thank please. You. Okay, this is uh, the French doors leading out to the uh, backyard, the rear patio. And if you could walk me through, did you do this one? Uh, I'm not sure if I dusted this, but I uh, uh, designated it and uh, marked it up. And if you could just walk me through what you did. All right, so after uh, the late prints were developed, uh, I go around, uh, people tell me where they found prints, and I will go around with a magnifying glass, pick out the prints for the best detail, uh, mark them, and label them in a similar manner, then uh, notify the photographer to uh, test their location so they can be properly photographed prior to collection. And picture six, please. That is off of a exterior door handle, and if I could refer to my report, I can get you the correct door. If you can, thank you. <clears throat> okay, that's the, uh, the same set of uh, French doors that we took prints off of uh, in the previous photograph. And this is uh, one of the exterior handles. And you can see the uh, lane print here. Uh, I remember developing this, uh, and then I went ahead and marked it as uh, Exhibit 80, uh, lane print number six.
Thank you, sir. You could have a seat. Now, I asked you previously about uh, the Chevy Suburban. Uh, if you can, uh, did, just briefly, and did you have an opportunity to process the Chevy Suburban at a later date? Yes. Uh, what day was that? It was uh, the 28th of May in 2019. Where were you located? At the New Canaan Police Department. The uh, vehicle was located in their Sally Port. And who was with you during that processing? Um, it was uh, Sergeant uh, Joe Duva was our uh, supervisor. It's myself, uh, Detective McGavin. Um, I believe uh, Detective Pearson, Detective Keppel. And if I can, sir, I'm going to draw your attention just to take a look behind you. This is under States 9, uh, file 14, picture 1. Do you recognize that, sir? Yes, that's the uh, Chevy Suburban uh, prior to our start of processing. Picture 2. That's the uh, rear of the Chevy Suburban. Picture three. That's a view of uh, one of the running boards of the Chevy Suburban. And if I can scroll in a little bit. Uh, sir, what is depicted in the white marker and the, I guess, pink arrow as well? Right, so that's a uh, blood-like stain we found just above uh, one of the running boards. It was uh, designated, tested, and swabbed and collected in, a, in the same manner as we did in the house. And with respect to the results? Uh, the test results were positive. And the swabbing, did you conduct that in the same process as you did the two swabs? And yes, two every... swabs, same collection. Okay. Now, were you wearing gloves and protective gear in the course of processing? The uh, yes, just gloves. If, by the way, what was your assignment with respect to May 28th uh, processing the vehicle? I still maintained a position of uh, evidence collection officer for this. Okay. Picture five, sir. That is a blood like stain pattern found on the uh, lower edge of one of the doors. And picture six. Uh, that's a sample from the stain pattern. Uh, I tested, uh, collected as a uh, state police exhibit 106. Uh, the arrow denotes uh, the stains that I, I took. The stains that you took for what? Oh, well, I'm sorry, that I swabbed uh, okay. and collected as evidence. State seven. Uh, again, those are uh, additional stain patterns found on uh, the door of the Suburban. And state eight. And that's a, a, another blood-like stain pattern. And same questions, same? Uh, it was um, tested, collected, and marked in, uh, in a similar fashion, collected with the two swabs. States nine. That's the uh, the blood like stain that I first saw on the bumper on Lapham Road. Um, and again, I tested it, um, collected it, and marked it as uh, State Police Exhibit 105, and uh, the test results were positive. States ten. Uh, that is a uh, blood like stain that was found on the steering wheel of the Chevy Suburban. And uh, same question, sir. Did you... uh, same, same collection method. It was uh, tested. Uh, test results were positive. It was uh, swabbed and collected as uh, State Police Exhibit 118. 
Um, were there also any swabbings done further of the inside of the vehicle? Uh, yes. Where? Um, um, I do believe we, we did uh, DNA swabs um, of the various parts of inside, inside of the vehicle in an attempt to collect uh, DNA. So we choose these areas based upon the areas that people touch when they're driving. So the insides of doors, uh, steering wheels, top and bottom, gear shift, areas such as that. Seats 11, what does that depict, sir? That's the rear cargo area of the uh, Chevy Suburban. Uh, the, the adhesive scales in the uh, the pink arrows denote areas where uh, blood-like staining was found. Specifically, I'm going to ask you about stage 12. What is that? Uh, that is uh, an area of blood-like staining. It's uh, hard to see with the dark carpet. <coughs> and that was found in the rear cargo area. It was uh, tested, um, collected and seized in the same manner as all the other uh, swappings of blood-like stains. It was uh, denoted as uh, State Police Exhibit 121. And the test results? Uh, test results were positive. And one more, sir. What is that? Uh, that's a, a blood-like stain found on um, I believe it's the driver's side wall of the rear cargo area. Uh, this also uh, field tested positive for blood and was uh, swabbed and collected as, as exhibit, uh, State Police Exhibit 120. Your Honor, with respect to the, um, the uh, next few photographs the state intends to introduce, uh, I know the um, court's ruling previously, but if I would, uh, perhaps now would be a time to excuse the jury for a few minutes or the state can go into it. So the court would not expect 10 minutes worth of argument. No, sir. So, ladies and gentlemen, we will excuse you for a brief period. Uh, there will be some discussion of the next exhibit. And so we ask that you retire to the deliberation room and please do not discuss the case. Please be seated, thank you. Would Your you Honor. put those up on the screen, please? Sure, Your Honor. I may, I believe it is. This would be picture 14, picture 15, and picture 16. Thank you. The easiest way for the court to probably do this is just a if brief may. offer of proof as to how these exhibits are going to be explained. If I may, Your Honor, may I just uh, yes. inquire of Detective yes. Riley? Thank you. Detective Riley, I'm going to have you draw your attention to photograph 14 behind you. What does that depict, please? That's a uh, photo of the rear cargo area. It's a uh, time exposure. So it's a, it's, uh, the photo's taken over a longer period of time after the application of uh, a chemical called luminol. Okay, a couple questions about what you just said, okay? Uh, with respect to the content of the photograph, uh, is, you said rear cargo area, is that of the Chevy Suburban? Uh, correct. Okay, now with the, um, were you present when this, happened yes okay uh, you use the word luminol what does that mean it's a uh, it's a chemical that we use uh, 
to detect latent blood, that is blood that's not readily seen. Um, we use it as a search tool. It's not a, you know, we don't use it as a presumptive. We uh, use it to search for blood that's not readily visible. Um, if we find stains of interest or areas of interest with the luminol, we'll go ahead, conduct, uh, you know, uh, further observations. We we'll utilize the KM test. And uh, if the KM test is positive, then we'll take uh, evidentiary samples from those areas. And with respect to aluminol, does that give it any um, presumptive weight? You said luminol for blood that's not readily available. How does that work? Or readily seen, I guess is the way you said it. Correct. Uh, yeah, it, it, the blood, we use it to search for latent blood. So the luminol um, reacts, it glows blue um, due to the iron present in blood. Uh, however, it reacts with uh, substances that contain iron, along with uh, you know several other different substances. Um, what we do is we once we mix up uh, a batch of luminol that we're going to use on scene, we'll apply it to our known blood sources, the horse blood, the pig blood, and uh, see see how that uh, reacts, and then we'll use it on a on an area of interest and see if we see any similar uh, reaction. So is it really the detection of iron? Is that what luminol um, is looking for? Um, well, that's that's what luminol reacts to in blood. Okay. And with respect to the fact that, well, strike that if I can. You said uh, you mix it up on scene. Yes. Walk me through that process. So we get our uh, luminol from a forensic supply house uh, it comes with a solvent, a bottle of solvent, um, and the luminol comes in powder form. Uh, we follow the instructions, we mix them together, uh, we attach a spray head, and then we'll apply it to a surface. Is this something that you're trained in? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I remember one class where we uh, did use luminol. And is this a, a tool that you have utilized in the course of your career at the Kansas State Police? Yes. About how often? Um, not a lot. I would say uh, I've probably applied luminol uh, 15 to 20 times. And with respect to the photograph exposure process, how does that work? So um, we'll set a... Uh, uh, a camera up on a tripod so it's steady. Uh, we'll put the camera settings to keep the shutter of the camera open for a longer period of time. Um, and then we'll apply the luminol and if there's a reaction, we'll open them, we'll uh, open the shutter, the camera will do its thing. And once the, the uh, photograph's complete, uh, we'll move to a different area. Is there a lighting on anywhere around? Oh, um, yeah, I apologize. Uh, so luminol has to be used in um, a, a darkened room. Uh, the bluish glow is very faint if, uh, if we have a reaction. So in this case, we close the Sally Port door. If there were windows on it, uh, I don't remember if there were, they would be papered over. Um, so we basically work in the dark with flashlights. If I may have one moment. Uh, that would be the state's offer, essentially. Yeah, yeah briefly. Cross. Well, well, this is just essentially an offer of proof. Yes. So this is how the court understands the offer. Luminol detects blood that cannot be seen with the naked eye. However, it detects in the court is not certain that this was the testimony. It detects any substance that contained iron. That includes blood. After that, there's further testing. After that, there may be the swabbing and the collection and essentially the KM test. That's how the court understands the testimony. The photos that are
viewed at this time are time-lapse photos. In other words, this isn't a snapshot, as the court understands it. It's a time-lapse photo. The blue as it appears on the screen, as the court understands it, is bluer than what would be seen typically because the testimony in the offer was that the blue is very faint. Here on the screen, the blue is not very faint. So during this offer, the court will ask you, Detective, is the color of the blue on the photograph darker than the blue that would appear after the application of luminol? That's, uh, that's what a uh, positive reaction looks like, Your Honor. So you would describe that as faint? Uh, it's faint where if it was in natural daylight, you wouldn't be able to see it. Oh, because it's against the backdrop of a, essentially a dark backdrop, it looks more vivid than it would look. No, that's fair, Your Honor. Well, the defense is concerned, uh, Attorney, Going horn, you may indicate. Yeah, very briefly, uh, the latter comment by Your Honor, this isn't how it would appear even in a uh, uh, in the detective's visual uh, appearance of the back of the vehicle. But my bigger concern is uh, there wasn't uh, this luminol is not a detection for blood; it's a detection for iron. This is the back of a vehicle. It detects steel, iron. I understand it also uh, can detect copper. It also can detect any vegetables or uh, that have uh, iron, such as turnips and horseradish, those kind of root vegetables, and a number of um, uh, any other kind of, of uh, food that might contain, like meats and whatnot, or uh, hamburger. If a, if a child was eating a hamburger in the back or it spilled a little bit, in the back. So more so my concern than the, more so even than the concern I have about the Castle Meyer test where there's an observation, it was a, um, a test was performed, a presumptive test, and then it was passed on. Here, there was no confirmatory test whatsoever. Therefore, and uh, when there was a, when the DNA from these areas was, uh, later tested. There was no DNA that uh, was determined to conform to the DNA of Jennifer Tula. So and in addition to the concern I have about it being misleading, the additional concern I have is that in light of what is going to happen later, there is no uh, relevance to it whatsoever. And, um, and I'll just note as an aside, my other concern is that um, the court allowed in the, the Castle Meyer multiple times, suggesting that, well, I can take care of that in cross-examination. My concern, Judge, is that it's shifting the burden to the defense to go over each and every time there was a, a claimed presumptive test when it's going to determine that many of them uh, turned out to be negative when they were tested at the lab. But, my concern here is different, at least in the other, um, my other objection. There was at least, as I understand it, the court said there was a visible item that was being tested, and that was why the witness did what he did. Anything else here, he's already testified up until this point that there were items he swiped. He can simply testify that he did take additional samples in the back without getting into what luminol is, what it does, and since it doesn't test for blood, it tests, and I left out bleach is another uh, substance that, that glows when uh, luminol is applied. And I, I don't know how that's going to, I don't even know if the state would then uh, not put on evidence of the, uh, what was done in the back of the car, and therefore that leads to the defense having to all laboratory people to say no, it was negative. It leaves a, a false impression that this was in fact somehow blood when I think the court is correct 
it only tests for things that have iron in them. And I would note copper as is, a, is, is not iron, but it also tests for copper. But in a motor vehicle, all of those things, especially in the cargo compartment, would likely be found. That's, and I'll just incorporate my prior um, arguments so I don't have to repeat any of that. If, well, if I can the, just the clarify. Court, the court can, can address this right now. The, again, issue of false impression, essentially giving life to what may be considered to be misleading, is not evident here. Not only is the luminol application far from conclusive, it is not even at the level of presumptive. It detects many more things than blood. It detects iron. Then there's further testing to get it up to the point of even being presumptive. So the court sees no danger for unfair prejudice or misleading evidence. The court is going to allow the evidence. Could the court at least, uh, what I'm not understanding, the court's I'm not understanding your honor's ruling because what the court said is it has essentially no evidentiary value, and then the court rules that it's admissible. I'm not, could the court at least articulate how it gets to that position? I'm just trying to understand the, down the road since we're going to be having this uh, uh, happen more often than you think. The court did not say it has no probative value. Relevant evidence is evidence that has any tendency to make a material fact more likely or less likely than it would be without the evidence. The court did not say it has no probative value. The state has the opportunity to present the case the way the state wishes to present the case. If it wishes to present evidence of luminol and latent blood that falls below a presumptive finding, that's the state's determination. I'll just ask the court to note my strong exception since I'll just remind the court that State versus Moody said that luminol has no probative value. So the fact that the court says it does, I don't know where to go with that other than to just enter my strong objection. We can bring the jury back. Just prior to the jury coming out, Your Honor, those three photographs are still ID only. Um, may I just inquire, they moved to the full exhibit at this time? Council stipulate to the presence of all of the jurors? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Do you wish to make your offer of those exhibits? Yes, Your Honor, I would. This would be um, States 9, file uh, 14. It, the offer involves photographs 14, 15, and 16. And objection, Attorney Sean Um I stated my objection. Thank you. Overruled. Which numbers are they, please? They are states 9, file 14, numbered photographs 14, 15, and 16. States 9, file 14, photographs 14, 15, and 16, admitted as full exhibit. Thank you. Sir, if I can, I'm going to draw your attention. There. States 13, if you can take a look at it, sir, is that, um, where is that located in the uh, Chevy Ch Suburban? Uh, that area is in the rear cargo, um, 
compartment of the Chevy Suburban that would be on the, uh, the driver's side. With respect to the rear cargo area of the Chevy Suburban, um, did you do anything to, in the course of processing the um, car, with respect to that area? Yes. What did you do? So we, uh, we conducted a search for uh, not only visible uh, blood-like stains, but late, latent blood-like stains. What do you mean by latent? Latent is, just means that you, you can't see it. It needs something to be developed. And what did you do <coughs> to develop that? So uh, we uh, utilized a, a chemical called luminol uh, that we get from a chemical supply house. It's, uh, it's a liquid that you uh, spray onto a surface in a uh, darkened environment, and it will react uh, with the iron uh, contained in blood. Um, and glow a uh, faint blue. And with respect to reacting with the iron in blood, does it react to other things as well? It reacts with a lot of different things. Can you name a few, please? Um, so it, react, it reacts with iron or anything with iron in it. Uh, it'll react with uh, uh, bleach. So it's a limited use in like a bathroom. Um, and it'll also uh, react with... Uh, uh, some foods as well. Um, there's there's a laundry list. Uh, we utilize it as a search tool. Uh, we have to do uh, further presumptive tests and then of course uh, any samples that we collect we have to send to a laboratory for confirmatory tests. And just for the record, the photograph 13 behind you, was that um, KM tested as well? Uh, that, that exhibit was KM tested. And seized as exhibit, what exhibit number did you uh, see? State Police Exhibit 120. And with respect to the pink arrow, what does that depict? That's uh, the area where I took those evidentiary swabs from. Okay. Now I'm going to show you what's been marked as States 14. What does that depict, sir? Uh, that is a time exposure of, uh, of our application of uh, luminol. Of uh, well, oh, I'm sorry. Of this what? Is, uh, sorry. Uh, this, this is the uh, the rear cargo area of the Chevy Suburban. Uh, while it was still parked in the Sally Port, uh, we close the doors. We make it a dark environment, and uh, you know we uh, we sprayed the luminol uh, throughout the rear cargo area and took several uh, time lap or uh, time exposures. Where do you get the luminol from? We get it from a, uh, a forensic supply house. How do you, uh, I guess, apply the luminol? So it comes, uh, the kit that we get from the chemical supply house uh, comes with a, a bottle of solvent. Uh, and then uh, luminol comes in powder form. We mix those two together. Uh, we attach a, a, a spray head. Uh, and then we uh, do a, a test on our known blood samples, our either pig blood or horse blood and see what kind of reaction we get. Then we will uh, apply it to a, uh, an area of interest and see if we get any reactions. If we get reactions, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, test those areas with the Castlemeyer test and um, then determine or not whether or not we want to take evidentiary samples. And did you do that in this case? Yes. Okay. Uh, how did you... Or I guess, how did you take a photograph? Uh, the photograph is, uh, is a time exposure. So basically, we put the camera on a tripod and uh, either set the automatic settings or uh, set shutter settings. So the shutter stays open on the camera for a longer period of time. Since it's a darkened environment, it takes that amount of time uh, to uh, take in enough light to make a photograph. And were you, um, well, I'll try. I'm going to show you behind you states 15. What does that depict, sir? Uh, that was taken uh, during our luminol examination. That's, again, the rear cargo area of the Chevy Suburban. Uh, I believe that's more focused on the driver's side of the vehicle. And states 16. What does that depict, sir? Uh, again, uh, taken during the luminol examination, 
uh, and that's the passenger side of the rear cargo area. Did you have an opportunity to examine the Chevy Suburban at a later date? Uh, yes. When was that? Uh, June the 26th of uh, 2019. And what was the purpose of that? The purpose of that was to uh, try and uh, search for additional biologic material um, to aid uh, the medical examiner's uh, cause and manner uh, investigation. Did you look at a specific area of the vehicle? Uh, the undercarriage specifically. And by undercarriage, what do you mean? Um, the, the underside of uh, the car. File 16, show you picture 17. Do you recognize that? Yes. What is that? That is the Chevy Suburban, uh, Jennifer Dulos's Chevy Suburban. Where is the location of this? Where was the location of this processing? Uh, this was uh, processed at Troop G Bridgeport. Picture 18. What does that depict, sir? That is the, uh, the passenger side of the Chevy Suburban. Uh, you can see the, uh, the black um, metal of the door on the upper part of the photograph. If you wouldn't mind, again, sir, if you can sure. get up and point to the photograph, please. Um, so you have a uh, vehicle here, and here is the undercarriage. Um, this is uh, the underside of the uh, step bumper, frame rail. And uh, this is uh, some blood-like material uh, we found uh, on the edge of the undercarriage. The word written on the white side, what does that mean? So that, uh, that was uh, placed there by the photographer to designate in which direction is the front of the vehicle. Just because uh, you know, the photographs can get a little confusing. Picture 19, what is that? Okay, this is uh, um, uh, an item of interest that we found uh, during an examination of the undercarriage. Again, this is on the passenger side. Uh, we're looking at this, um, this clearish um, uh, little uh, specimen right there. So, and um, we designated this as item A. Um, our collection process for this is I removed this uh, with a sterile scalpel, uh, packaged it in a little paper fold, and uh, uh, later uh, the next day transported it to the medical examiner's office so he can do a uh, he can put it underneath the microscope and look and see uh, you know what kind of cells are there. Um, in the same area after this was removed. I, would, I went ahead and swabbed uh, the area with uh, sterile water, same manner, uh, with two swabs. And photograph 20, please. Uh, item B, uh, I believe it's on the frame rail. Uh, so you can see the exhaust here, uh, bolts for the, uh, the running board. And so I'm looking at this uh, little fleck of material right there. Again, this was collected in a similar manner. Picture 21. Uh, item C is uh, on the uh, on the running board. This this area here. Uh, you can see it's a it's a little heavier of a stain. Uh, there's a little. Uh, it appears to be like a little yellow here. And it's different than you know. Uh, there's more there than just typical blood like staining, so that's why it was an item of interest. Again, this is collected in a similar manner, scraped off into a paper fold, and then the area was swabbed afterwards. Picture 22, please. This is a, a photo of what would look to us to be a footwear impression on the uh, on inside one of the wheels of the Chevy Suburban. Uh, and I believe this was taken on the 28th of May during our vehicle processing. Picture 23. Uh, again, uh, we uh, printed the exterior of the vehicle. And I believe we took 
took a swab from here, but I'm not really sure now. Would it refresh your recollection to take a look at your exhibit report? Yes. Does that refresh your recollection, sir, yes. as to if there was a swap done of that photo? What's the picture in that photograph? Yeah, so this is the uh, uh, the exterior side of the, the vehicle's tailgate. Um, I think this is the bottom edge right here. And during our examination of, uh, you can see the application of the fingerprint powders. All right, there, there's not a lot of, uh, there's absolutely no ridge detail here whatsoever. However, uh, it was handled, so we uh, swabbed it. We, or I took two swabs uh, that were moistened with sterile water, swabbed this area, and then collected it and designated it as, as uh, State Police Exhibit 113. In picture 24, sir. <clears throat> this was uh, taken during a latent print exam uh, of the exterior of the vehicle. Uh, again, we're running sequentially with uh, latent print numbers, so this is latent print 11, State Police Exhibit 114. And again, I uh, designated it with a uh, blue china mark, <coughs> arrow for orientation. And picture 25. <clears throat> Uh, it's a appears to us to be like a partial palm print. Um, on, uh, I'm not sure where the, exactly this was on the suburban. Would it refresh your recollection to take a look at your report? Yes. And just for the record, I'm almost done with this section. And one more question after this. Well, it's the answer, the link of the answer that concerns me. <laughs> <laughs> So the court is going to conclude for the lunch recess after this photograph. Thank you. This is the uh, this was developed on the rear edge of the right front door. So um, kind of near the, the window. Okay. And so uh, again, uh, designated as latent print number twelve, exhibit one fifteen, uh, marked and lifted in the same manner. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we approach our lunch and recess. We plan to resume at 2 o'clock. Please do not discuss the case. Thank you. Thank you.
So is Detective Riley still on the stand? He is, Your Honor. You can bring him in now, and then we will bring the jury in. Jurors are not ready to come in. They're, on the, they're coming out of the uh, jury assembly room. So we will just take a brief recess.
picture 25. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, just briefly, with respect to this photograph, uh, there is a arrow at the bottom right of the uh, photograph. Do you see that? Yes. What is that arrow supposed to depict? That arrow uh, uh, basically designates up, or it orient, helps orient the print. Okay. And last photograph on that file, uh, 14, picture 26. Uh, that is a, uh, another latent print uh, lifted from the Suburban. With respect to the, uh, oh, was this also designated a number, an exhibit number? Yes, this was uh, latent print number 13, uh, State Police Exhibit 116. Okay. With respect to the Chevy Suburban, um, was there another day that it was examined or processed? <coughs> Uh, yes, in June. Okay, so in, in the June processing, uh, what did that entail? That, entail, that entailed uh, uh, examining the undercarriage of the vehicle. Okay. And was there a third time that that vehicle was processed? Yes, that was uh, sometime in September, I believe. Um, in the, in uh, a few uh, months later? 2019, 2019. correct. 2019, thank you. Where was the vehicle located when it was processed? It was located in the uh, impound lot at uh, Troop L. Litchfield. And what was the purpose of that examination? That was to uh, obtain uh, more swabs from the interior of the vehicle, more swab samples. And were any swabs taken? Yes. So what were those swabbings? I seized swabs from uh, uh, the steering wheel, uh, gear shift, believe uh, uh, seat adjustment controls, things like that. And do you recall what uh, exhibit number those were? Uh, not off the top of my head, no. Okay. If I may just have one moment. <coughs> Don't cut the box up here. Never mind. If I may just have one moment, Your Honor. Um, I'll withdraw that, Your Honor. I don't have my file for that one. May I just have a moment? Yes. I don't want to. <coughs> So with respect to the other vehicle that was inside the garage, the Range Rover, I'm going to draw your attention specifically to States 9, file 15. Okay, if you can, take a look behind you, sir. What does that vehicle depict, please? Or, I'm sorry, what does that picture depict? That's the, uh, the front of the Range Rover that was parked in the garage at 69 Wells. Picture two, and what does that show? That is the uh, driver's side <laughs> of the Range Rover. And I'm gonna draw your attention actually down to and scroll in to the here where there's a pink sticky and a marking. It's a little blurry, but can you see what that depicts, Chef? Um, I can't see, ma'am, but it's marked up uh, in a similar manner uh, of a swab being taken. Do you recall what swabbing that was? Uh, can I take a closer look at the screen? Yes, and would it also refresh your recollection and take a look at your report? That would be better. If I may just approach the clerk, Your Honor. Yeah. for 
ID. <clears throat> Did that refresh your recollection, sir? Yes. Uh, if you could, if you wouldn't mind, uh, what, if you wouldn't mind getting up and pointing to the screen again, I apologize. And could you please identify, if you could, to your knowledge and recollection, what uh, markings those are? Yes, that is um, Exhibit 61 is on the uh, front door. And 62 is on the rear door. And with respect to those exhibits, um, did you swab them? Yes, they were uh, <clears throat> um, field tested, swabbed and collected in the same manner as the other stains in the garage. And was that two swabs? Uh, two swabs for the evidentiary uh, collection. And CAM result? Uh, CAM uh, was positive. Okay. Uh, state picture three. What is that, sir? Uh, that is another uh, blood-like stain uh, found on the Range Rover. As far as location, I would have to refer to my report. If you could, sir, please. And do you know the location of that uh, photograph or what's depicted in that photograph? Yes, that was a blood-like stain uh, we found on the left side of the hood. Okay. It, was that swabbed? Yes, it was uh, field tested, uh, swabbed and collected. And the results of the field test? Uh, field test was positive. <laughs> Sir, uh, picture four out of file uh, 15, I believe. What does that picture depict, sir? So that's the uh, um, Exhibit 61 I spoke about uh, before on the uh, front door of the, excuse me, left front door of the Range Rover. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the apparent spatter pattern that the stain was uh, collected out of. And same questions with respect to the, the seizing of it as a new exhibit, please. Yeah, so that was uh, that, uh, field tested, it was field tested positive, and then it was collected in the usual manner. And that's uh, two swabbings? Uh, two swabbings, correct. Thank you. Picture five. Uh, that's a blood-like stain found on the left rear door of the Range Rover. Um, and that was uh, field tested, uh, it was KM positive, and it was collected with two swabs, uh, similar to all the others. And when you say rear door, which side of the vehicle? Uh, that was uh, driver's side, left side. Picture six. Picture six is the left front corner uh, of the bumper of the Range Rover. Um, State Police Exhibit 60 was a swabbing, um, or two swabbings, collected from that stain that the arrow was pointing to. And Exhibit 69 is a sample of the blood-like stain um, that was found below it. Uh, <coughs> both items were field tested. They field tested positive, and both were collected in the usual manner two swabs <clears throat> picture seven uh, that is a photo of exhibit state police exhibit 63 uh, the location of which escapes me ma'am if I you could refer, refer to your exhibit report please which <clears throat> for the record is states 11 friday Okay. 
Okay, that stain is on the left rear fender of the Range Rover. Um, it was also field tested uh, positive with the KM test and was collected with two swabs in the usual manner. Picture eight. Uh, okay, so eight is a latent print taken from the Range Rover. Um, latent print number nine, exhibit 93. Um, if I could double check the location. If you could refer to your report, please. And latent print number nine was lifted from the uh, front fender. And uh, just with respect to the latent print number nine, can you just walk us through the process of taking the print off of the vehicle? So this print, um, again, once it was developed um, and marked, photographed, we would take uh, uh, adhesive acetate, something clear, uh, Probably in this case, uh, I used a gelatin lifter. Again, uh, it's a thin layer of gelatin on top of a rubber backing. Uh, it kind of molds better to the, the curves of the, uh, the car. Picture nine. That is a, a photo of exhibit 58, which was a sampling of the blood-like stains found on the grill. And if you could just uh, head up to the screen, I have a few questions with this. Now, with respect to Exhibit 58, uh, what are you, what did you designate 58 as? It was these uh, blood-like stains here. And did you do any testing or anything on those stains? Uh, I field tested these with the KM test. Um, which was a positive test. Okay. Actually, if you could, what about up here, one above, I'll start with the one above the V. I believe those scales were placed there to document the, uh, the apparent uh, spatter found up here, uh, probably placed there by the photographers. Did you take any uh, samples or swabbings, I should say, for anything above the, the rover? Or no, because they're not marked as an exhibit. Okay. Picture 10. Okay. So with respect to the, um, right above the, I guess the measurement marking or the, the label, the exhibit 58, um, was that the area that was swabbed? Or that you're designated as Exhibit 58, or is it, my other question is, is it above the grill? Is it separated, or did you include that as the entire, um, any of the blood spatter? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, can I refer to my exhibit report? If you can. Okay, I was mistaken. Uh, this wasn't a blood swab. Um, we were treating this um, this apparent uh, impression or a print and blood-like material that we found on the grill. Uh, we photographed this in the usual manner, I mean, in a manner similar to uh, the uh, the way we did the prints on the floor. So uh, these are photographed. And then later the photographs were designated as Exhibit 58. So just to be clear, there was not swabbed in this? I did not swab this. Okay, uh, and it was not tested or it was tested? Uh, I believe... Um, Objection. I'm just asking well, to clarify, Your Honor. The question is, was this swabbed or was it not swabbed? And the response was going to be, I believe. No, there can be a follow-up question. Court will overrule the objection. I can't say for sure. And with respect to any uh, any 
testing on it, do you recall if there was any testing on Exhibit 58? Uh, nothing beyond photography. <coughs> we under photograph 11. What does this depict? Uh, that is more blood-like stains on the grill of the uh, Range Rover. And picture 12. Uh, that is uh, another photo of the blood-like stains on the left rear door of the Range Rover. And what about this marking from, I guess, in the middle and of so the... And so, um, along the side of the car, you can see in this road grime here, uh, you know, salt, dirt, sand, uh, you can kind of see it like a swipe mark through there. Picture 13. A uh, photo of uh, some blood like stains on the, this is the left front wheel of the Range Rover. Now, with respect to the Range Rover, was there also a uh, additional processing? Yes, we process this in, a, in our uh, usual manner of uh, processing the vehicle. And I'm going to show you what's marked. Before we proceed, Attorney Manning, it may be more advantageous for the record if there was a better description of wheel. Oh. Is it tire? Is it rim? That's true. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, if you could just describe um, what you see in the photograph, please. Of uh, This is States 13. Uh, sure. Uh, when I refer to the wheel, it's really the rim, uh, not, not the rubber tire. So I'm looking at these, uh, I'm referring to these blood-like stains inside uh, the metal of the rim. And for the record, you're pointing to where on the photograph? Um, basically throughout the, in the uh, approximate center of the photo. And picture 14, sir, do you recognize that? Yes. What is that? That's the Range Rover. Uh, we examined this along with the uh, Chevy Suburban at Troop Sheet in Bridgeport on uh, June the 26th, 2019, uh, for similar material, additional biological material from the under carriage. Picture 15. What does that picture depict? This is an overall um, view of the undercarriage uh, seen while the vehicle was up on a lift. You can see um, on this L-shaped scale here, the photographer added a directional arrow for front. So the front would be the top of the screen. And then uh, driver's side or left side of the vehicle is toward the right side of the screen. Picture 16. Uh, this was um, seized from the lower area um, of the Range Rover. Uh, as item D. Again, this was scraped into a uh, paper fold, uh, designated as item D, and later the area was uh, swapped. And item E. Uh, I'm sorry. Picture 17. <clears throat> With respect to item E on picture 17. Yes, this is, is on that? the left side of the Range Rover. Again, uh, kind of around the rocker panel. So uh, item E is designated by the arrow. This uh, material was scraped into a paper fold and later the, uh, the area was swabbed. And picture 18, please. Again, just a, another photo of uh, item E. Thank you, sir. You can sit down. I want to go back and ask you a few more questions about that October um, October processing of the Chevy Suburban. Um, do you recall how many exhibits you took, if any, out of the car that day? Uh, not off the top of my head, ma'am. If I can. Would it refresh your recollection if you gave me a report? Yes. I may have 
Yes. Okay, ma'am. Did that refresh your recollection, sir? Yes. Okay. Uh, with respect to that processing, how many swabs were taken out of the car that day? Uh, there were six exhibits uh, containing anywhere between two and four swabs. And what were some of the, if I, for instance, um, do you recall exhibit 370? Yes. So what was that swabbing of? That was a swabbing of the uh, steering wheel. Um, and that was... <coughs> um, was complete with uh, four swabs. Okay. And are you utilizing a report to refresh your recollection on this? Yes. Okay. Exhibit 371? Uh, 371, again, uh, four swabbings from the steering wheel. Uh, these were from the um, areas with visible blood stains. Uh, the item before that 370 was taken from unstained areas or apparent unstained areas. Attorney Manning, the court heard that there was a third processing in September 2019, and council made reference to a processing in October. If I may uh, inquire of Detective Riley, Your Honor, is there another processing in September? Uh, no. The processing, this, the processing where we took the extra swabs was actually, the proper date was October 18th. Thank you. I apologize. And, uh, with respect to exhibit, how about exhibit 372? 372 was uh, four swabs taken from the interior side of the left front door. Do you recall where the, that was on the door? Um, it was, uh, I ran the swabs around all areas of the door in an effort to pick up as much uh, genetic material as I could. And exhibit 373? Uh, that was taken from the... Uh, the left front seat adjustments, uh, this was two swabs. And by front seat adjustments, just what do you mean by that? So they're the uh, side buttons on, uh, on the driver's seat used to adjust, uh, adjust the seat for the driver. And 374? Uh, 374 was uh, swabs taken from uh, the rear view mirror. And 375? And 375. Um, was swabs taken from the rear seat controls in the cargo area. If I may have one moment, Your Honor. Yes. I have nothing further. Thank you. Cross examination, Attorney Shaw. Good afternoon, Mr. Riley. You're retired, right? Yes. I hope you're enjoying your retirement. I am, thank you. Let me ask you a few questions. Let's start with these, this presumptive testing that you know, we've talked a lot about here. Um, it's my understanding, as, as you testified, that when we're talking about these chemical presumptive tests, there are at least two that you talked about today, right? Yes. The first was called Castle Meyer begins with a K instead of a C, right? It's like hyphenated two names. Yes. And the second one was something called luminal, right? Yes. And Castle Meyer, you said, is made up of uh, two chemicals. One is phenylphthalein, right? Yes. And the other is hydrogen peroxide, right? Yes. Now, phenylphthalein is the stuff that they use to test swimming pools for chlorine, right? Isn't that the same stuff? I don't know, sir. So you're not an expert in, in science. You're not a chemist or anything like that, right? No. 
So when you said you had some training in it, you were trained in how to administer it, right? Yes. You don't know anything about the chemistry itself and why something uh, shows pain or glows or changes color at all, right? That's correct. And the training you said you also received from the lab some kind of like a kit in order to administer it, right? Yes. And phenolphthalein is a um, liquid, isn't it? Yes. And, and so is uh, hydrogen uh, peroxide, correct? Yes. Now, hydrogen peroxide, that's the same chemical that you use maybe if you have an infection, maybe, to disinfect, right? Yes. And I guess some people might even use it to uh, bleach their hair, right? In the, in the day, right? Isn't there people have peroxide hair where they really white bleach blonde. Is that the same stuff? I'm not, I'm not sure, sir. Okay. But in any event, you also said that there are things... When you talk about presumptions, right, you're, you're trying to see if there's a place that you're going to do some swabbing or photography, right? For uh, the Castlemeyer, yeah. it's more, um, we do our searches visually. Okay, so you see something that looks like a stain, right? You maybe uh, do a little... Uh, Chemical wipe with the KM, right? Or collect or conduct the KM test, correct? You do a KM test, and if it comes back <clears throat> negative, do you still take a picture of it? Uh, sometimes. So we saw a couple of those. You tested a stain on the floor of the garage, and it didn't even come up with a presumptive test, right? Right. But in any event, if it comes up presumptive, one of the things you indicated that it's presumptive for is blood, right? Uh, well, to test, it's presumptive for blood. That's what I mean. The right. test is presumptive for, de for um, blood by putting the two chemicals together with the sample, right? Yes. And you did mention a couple of things that it also is presumptive for, right? Uh, yes. Animal blood is one? Yes. And of course, there's all sorts of animals, right? Yes. It doesn't distinguish between one animal or another, does it? No. I think you also mentioned horseradish is something that it uh, tests positive for. That's that's one of the classical examples. Okay. Now, there, are you familiar with some of the other things that it tests positive for? Uh, I'm familiar with turmeric. Turmeric, right? right. Now, right. doesn't it also test positive for tomato? Uh, I don't know. What about rust, iron rust? Uh, I don't know. You don't know? No. How about bleach? Do you know about that? No. How about copper? No. You don't know. Is that what you're saying? Whether it tests, whether it will show a presumptive positive for um, copper? Uh, like iodized copper? I don't think so, sir. How about malt? Like you find in either beer or a milkshake? Uh, that I don't know either. Aren't there, in fact, 16 different food groups that test positive using Castlemeyer? Uh, I don't know, sir. We'd have to have somebody who's like a scientist that knows this to really answer those questions, right? Yes. But um, if we're talking about a presumptive test, if you wanted to be presumptive about the presence of horseradish, this would be the test you use, right? Um, I would need to presume something was horseradish, sir. Well, the presumptive test is not what you think, it's whether it turns pink, right? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm following your question, sir. I mean, it does react in a positive manner with horseradish. So I'm saying if I wanted to presume that a stain on my kitchen cabinet is horseradish, I might use this test, right? If you really wanted to. Exactly. And so let's say a... Um, I don't know, spilled hamburger, piece of hamburger juice. That would test positive, right? I don't know. I've never tried it on hamburger, sir. Well, hamburger is basically animal meat, right? Yeah, but I've never tried it on hamburgers. Fair enough. But it would also test positive for, I don't know, a cat, a little blood of a cat, right? Oh, yes, animals, absolutely. Mice, right, is a garage, right? If, if you had an injured mouse, yes. But 
you would also agree, would you not, that you would need a confirmatory test done by a lab to see whether the presumption or assumption turned out to be correct, right? Yes. And you know that in your, never mind this case, but in your experience, some of the things that you show a positive presumptive test turn out not to be uh, blood at all, correct? Uh, I've never had that experience. Well, you don't do the actual testing, do you? No, I mean, when I learn of the results, I've never had that experience. So you don't know that in this case, that was in fact, several of these items turned out not to have any uh, evidence of blood in it? Objection, Your Honor. Sustain. You didn't even test all of the spots that we just saw pictures of, did you? Me personally? No, yeah. I didn't. Let me ask you a few questions about luminol. We saw some pictures in the back of the uh, of the suburban, right? Including a couple in the dark where you see this little purple glow, right? Blue glow, correct, sir. Blue, purple. Um, those were kind of like, with those with photographs were taken with a um, time-lapse photography, right? Uh, yes. So they appeared brighter than they might with the naked eye, correct? Uh... I can't say for sure, sir. And you use that in order just to choose where you might take another spot, right? Yes. Now, you said that um, luminol tests for the presence of iron, right? Yes. So you know that a car is made out of steel, or most of them are, right? Yes, it is. And steel is an iron alloy, is it not? It is. So it would stand to reason that in a uh, motor vehicle, there might be some exposed metal places that might test positive using luminol, right? Oh, correct. So if you wanted to um, see if your car was rusty, <coughs> you might spray some luminol on it, and you would have a positive glowing result, right? Uh, it, it would even glow on the non-rusted parts. Right, but you're, it would glow on even the non-rusted parts because right. you're in a car, right? Uh, yes. And if you're talking about, let's say, a car where there are children that have been passengers in that car, there might be all sorts of other things that will test positive for the presence of iron. Isn't that true? Uh, possibly, yes. You know that um, I think turnips also test positive for luminol, don't they? I don't know that for a fact. You know, a lot of root vegetables have iron in them, right? No. You do know that, I right? do know. And it's, it's actually good for you to eat, right? Yeah. Am I right? I'm going to object to your honor. Well, the question's not relevant, sustained. If you wanted to see if you maybe dropped a turnip on the ground in the back seat of the car, you might lose use luminol and it might glow, right? Objection. Ground. Well, Irrelevance and I assume it's facts, not in evidence. Well, the line of the cross examination is a number of substances or fruit or vegetable contain iron. This is just an extension of that line overruled. All right. I think you'd be able to see a turnip. It would need luminol. But the luminol might illuminate it, right? Uh, I don't know. I've never tried it on never a turnip, sir. Fair enough. Bleach also <laughs> will glow in luminol on it. Yes. You already mentioned horseradish for K&M. This would also test positive in luminol, wouldn't it? Uh, I don't know for sure. How about rust? Uh, yes. So if a, a child had, let's say, ice skates in the back of the car, some of that maybe scratched off on the back seat, objection. that would test positive for luminol, wouldn't it? Well, here's an objection. And it calls for a hypothetical, but the hypothetical isn't developed in such a way as to aid the jury. Essentially what the question is, is since there are ice skates, ice skates have metal, probably steel, steel is an alloy of iron. In other words, it's an extension, but the extension is becoming very thin. So the court is going to allow the question. And I will then move on, but if you want to just answer that question, I'm not going to go into a million hypotheticals. Yes, it's possible. All right. 
A lot of these photographs that we've seen were various angles of the very same spots that you tested. Isn't that right? Uh, yes. So just by looking at these photographs, you'd have to look very carefully to see whether or not uh, three, four, or maybe even five photographs were of the same location that you did a swap. Isn't that right? No, I just swabbed from the areas that were marked as exhibits. Oh, no, no, I understand right. that. I'm talking about <laughs> photographs with different angles to a certain extent of the same areas that you had swabbed. Yes. I also want to be clear about the, uh, the measuring tapes that are in many of these pictures. The white tape is in centimeters and millimeters, correct? And I believe it's inches on one side, too. Well, the yellow, isn't the yellow uh, the inches? Uh, you, you said the white tape, sir? Yeah, doesn't the white tape say metric on some of them in those pictures? Uh, I don't know. I would have to look at the pictures. All right, fair enough. But if, if you're familiar with the fact that there's a distinction between the metric system, which uses centimeters and millimeters, and the American measuring system that uses inches and feet, right? Yes. I want to ask you a few questions about the uh, paper towels in the kitchen. And the first thing I want to do is call up one of the pictures that um, was on the exhibit that was introduced through you. And if I could have 8-139 for your edification, this is the image where you put the, the state police uh, exhibit number 13 on. If you would look at that screen behind you, sir. You see that image there? Yes. And I think you testified that this was the paper towel that you examined. You did a, a some kind of a, a, a test on it as well, right? Yes. And you seized the whole thing or just a portion of it? Uh, the whole thing, sir. When you came into the house that day, this would be the 25th, correct? Uh, yes. Was this exactly when you went in the location where you found this paper towel roll? Uh, not the exact location, no. It was moved around? Uh, it was in that general same corner of the sink, sir. Did you move it so that somebody could take a better picture? No, I moved it so I could examine it and field test it. When, you, when this picture was taken and you put that yellow tab next to it, is that the location you found it in before you moved it and examined it? Uh, no, I don't believe so, sir. Not to Where say was it when you first observed it, if you can just point it out on this uh, photograph? I would just uh, remember in that general corner of the sink, sir. So when you say in the corner of the sink, was it off the uh, roller? That is the, um, the, the metal device that the paper towel roll is uh, standing next to? I believe so, but I'm not sure, sir. Did you observe anyone else move it? Uh, it no. And just so that we're talking about the same thing, right? Um, I'm referring to this item here that's to the left of the paper towel roll. You see that there? Yes. Sir. You recall seeing that there, right? Yes. But when you got there, that paper towel roll was not on that device, the, the dispenser roll. Uh, I. I think they were separate, but I'm not sure. Well, if, if you're not sure, do you not recall seeing someone physically remove it? Objection. Well, the response was he's not sure if it was on the holder. And the question is, was, well, if you are not sure, can you recall someone seeing, or can you recall seeing someone Move it off of the holder. No, I didn't see anybody move it off of the holder, sir. So it wasn't placed there in order for um, you specifically to examine it in that location. Is that fair statement? No, I searched that area of the house, sir. Okay. So um, I'm going to uh, 
ask you now, I had a couple of screenshots taken from, I think it's Exhibit 7. We had uh, Detective Clabby had a video. I took, took a couple of screenshots from it, and I'm just going to show you um, if I can. Excuse me, may I have a moment with counsel? Yeah. yeah. What time is this? Tell me a second. I'm going to have this marked if I may. Yeah. So I'm going to show you, is there any uh, objection to uh, today? That's those. Those that's this one or this one? Yeah, that's this one. Yeah. No objection, thank you. What's the marking, please? Defense <coughs> exhibit A. Defense A admitted as a full exhibit. So if you could, um, you, before we show you the image, before you got there, you know that Detective Clavy was also on the scene, is that right? Um, well, we were there at the same time, sir. Fair enough. Did you all arrive in the van, or did you come separately? No, we came separately. But you recall seeing him there? Yes. You knew that he was assigned the videography for that scene that day? Yes. Did you observe him doing any videography? Yes. Did he do that, at least the, the overview, before you got to work making any uh, uh, examples, any swaps, or anything like that, taking any pictures? Yes. All right, so I'm going to show you a, a couple of screenshots from that from that um, video that Detective Clavy took. And you did have you seen that video at any point? Uh, not in a long time, sir. All right, so I'm going to show you uh, one screenshot called uh, "Screenshot." Let me just put that up, please. Now, looking at the uh, video screenshot that I've just put up here. You see that the paper towel is on the dispenser in that image, correct? Correct. So my question to you, was that how it was when you observed it, or was it already off the roll when you uh, examined it? Objection. Um, Asked and answered, Your Honor. He indicated he doesn't remember. Well, the response has been he does not remember. All right. Does that help? Or does looking at this image help you uh, refresh your recollection as to whether or not uh, it was on the dispenser when you arrived. Objection, Your Honor. Grounds. Again, it's he's been asked and answered. It's now a full exhibit. Um, well, the, I'll, I'll withdraw. I'll withdraw the question. I'll withdraw the question. I'm going to show you another um, screenshot in a moment, but well, it's up there now. This is from the pantry. Do you recall looking in the pantry at the uh, in that kitchen? Between the kitchen and the mudroom. In uh, between the mudroom and the dining room, sir. Yes. Uh, yes. All right. So, if you would just put up that image, this is also from the same exhibit. Do you recall that this was the view of that uh, pantry when you looked at it? Um, yes, that's consistent. Did you take any swabs or collect any evidence from what's shown in that uh, image? I did not. Could I have this mark, please? I would uh, offer exhibit, defense exhibit B. 
No objection? No, sir. The bench be admitted as a full exhibit. I'm going to show you an image that was taken from the uh, by the officer who arrived at New Canaan Police uh, from the New Canaan Police Department on the evening of May 24th, 2019. All right, so if we could have that. I don't know if you don't recognize the uh, Buchanan police officer that's seen in this image, do you? Uh, no. And I'll just note the time is indicated at 524.19 at uh, 1957 and 33. This is from State's Exhibit uh, 1, I believe, which was the video that was from the body camera of the one of the patrol officers that was there that night. Okay? Okay. So again, I'm just going to ask you to um, note... Did you ever see the paper towel roll on the dispenser at, when you were at the uh, house? I don't remember. Now, I'm also going to show you two other images. Um, I think uh, they're also from this exhibit. X8, please. It's image 0064 from that exhibit. Do you recall seeing any of the items that are indicated here during your, your investigation on May 25th, 2019, inside the home? Uh, specific items? Any specific items in the pantry that we're seeing here? Uh, no. I'll show you the next picture, please, which is... Um, it's image 0065, or I'm just calling it X21 for my, uh, does this particular roll, did you observe this roll of, of paper towel in the pantry at six, at, at Wells Lane when you were there collecting it? Uh, I don't remember that. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures from the uh, from the garage that we've already been through and uh, you described where you took certain uh, swabs. The first picture I want to show you is uh, from your from your disc exhibit, which I believe the whole exhibit is I think seven. I'm sorry, I'll just have a moment. Nine. The, no. the large display. No, the, the one that you put in yesterday. That. Yes. Nine. It is nine. Okay. Nine. Yes. Sure. I'm going to show you some images from, from uh, Exhibit 9, if I may. And um, the first exhibit I want to ask you about is um, Mark on your Exhibit 9 is 12 362. Fab, we could have that up on the screen, please. Recall this is the exhibit that you marked as A16, or somebody marked as A16, correct? 
correct? Uh, I don't think that was an exhibit. I think that was just for documentation purposes. All right. So right. Let, let me also get that clarification. If there's a yellow placard, then it was then it was seized as some kind of an exhibit for your purposes of your investigation. Is that correct? Or it was marked on a on a similar label with ex whatever. So the A not letter was was that your writing on this document on this mm, image? No. This would be something that the whichever detective was placing these markers down would have noted. Is that right? Yes. And I asked you this when we were first putting some of these pictures up. If we look at this image here, when you saw the um, this particular marker, did you note the um, the marking on the sticker itself? No, I didn't note it. You did not? No. Okay. So you don't know how that got there? Specifically, no. Okay. I'm going to show you another image. This one is 13-363. Um, it's in the same series. And um, this is also one of the images that you testified to yesterday, correct? Uh, yes. And I'm going to ask you specifically about the mark on the middle of this document here. Was that present when you were examining that particular uh, spot on the, on the ground? I, I don't remember it. You don't recall seeing that? No. And you also testified, if I'm not mistaken, that there was also a fair amount of, you call it vegetative matter, seeds or leaves and whatnot on this garage floor, correct? Yes. And you, did you gather any of those? No. Um, show you one more uh, in this series. This would be 14-157. Uh, Once again, I'm just going to ask you whether or not you recognize or saw this item on the placard when you were uh, looking at this particular location. On I don't recall it being there. And when you talk about other items, whatnot, seeds and whatnot on the floor, are we talking about, if we look at this picture, are we talking about all of these other specific items, dots and whatnot that we see on the cement floor on a close-up? Is that what you're talking about? Um, yes. There are also some larger leaves, correct? Larger leaves, well, stones, sand, things like that. Sand, what else? Uh, small stones. Before All just on the what you might expect to find on a garage floor. Before right? you proceed, counsel, the court needs to clarify something that is quite subtle. Detective Riley, on the previous photograph, you indicated you did not remember whether you saw that spot on the measuring marker, correct? Uh, that's that's what I said yesterday. But then. You said, I don't recall seeing it. Now, it may sound the same, but there's subtle differences. I don't remember whether I saw it. To this court means I don't remember whether it was there or not. I don't recall seeing it means, in this court's view, I don't remember that it was there. Which one is it? It was a former. I did not take note of it, Your Honor. Thank you. With regard to the um, search of the um, Chevy, you said that you were sent back to take additional uh, samples in October of 2019. Is that correct? That's correct. And as I understand from your testimony, it was from Additional samples of the steering wheel? Uh, yes. From the interior of the left front door? Yes. From the front seat adjustment control? Yes. From the rear view mirror? Yes. From the cargo area? Yes. From the rear seat controls? 
Uh, weren't those one and the same, sir? Well, that was going to be my next question. Were those separate places, or did you take them from the rear seat controls in the cargo area because the seats were down? Uh, yeah, I believe what I remember, the rear seat controls were in the cargo area. Because the back seat, the second row of seats were not up, they were down. Is that why you entered that way? I don't remember whether okay. they were up or down, sir. You were sent back to do additional swabs because the first set didn't produce any information of value. Objection. True? Well, the question is, you were sent back to take additional swabs because the first set didn't yield uh, anything of evidentiary value. So what's the objection? It's a mischaracterization of evidence, assumes facts not in evidence. Um, and uh, well, and it calls for a hearsay answer, Your Honor. Well, let's take them one at a time. The question was, you were sent back. That's one segment. Because what you swabbed the first time did not yield anything of evidentiary value. Well, whether you were sent back or not is not material. It's the second segment. Because what you recovered the first time was of no evidentiary value. Well, that assumes, in this court's view, facts that can be interpreted differently, but in this court's view, specifically, it's misleading. Sustained. The purpose of going back in October was an attempt to get biological material from those locations in the, in the suburban, correct? Yes. And whatever you did, you made uh, the same kind of swipe type activity that you've described earlier? Uh, yes. And then you sent that on to the, to the state lab at some point, right? Uh, me, I don't know if I did personally, but um, that's the usual process. All right. well, well, let me just, I'll, I skipped a step, all right? So you gathered it, and it was then sent into evidence, right? Uh, yes. And then at some point, it was that was done for the purpose of, at some point, having it examined by the state forensic laboratory, correct? I believe so. Not sure, though, sir. Well, whether these particular items were then sent on or not, that would have been the purpose of collecting it, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. Just have a moment. I have no further questions. Thank you. Is there a redirect? Um, just a couple of questions, if I can. Uh, Detective Riley, uh, do you recall Attorney Schoenhorn asking you about the other items that a presumptive test could test positive for? Do you recall that line of questioning? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, I think some of the things he questioned were about radishes. Do you remember that? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, in the garage floor, uh, did you find any evidence of radishes anywhere? No. Okay. What about um, cheeseburgers anywhere on the floor? No cheeseburgers. What about on the undercarriage of the Chevy Suburban? Uh, did you find any cheeseburgers or radishes there? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay. What about the undercarriage of the Land Rover? Any cheeseburgers or radishes there? No. What about turmeric? Any bottles of turmeric or turmeric sources on the floor of the garage? No, ma'am. The Land Rover? No. Uh, the Chevy Suburban? No. All right. Um, with respect to the cargo area of the Chevy Suburban, um, did you find any uh, evidence of car seats? Any evidence that children were sitting in the trunk area? In the back? No, ma'am. Uh, with respect to that cargo area, did you see a lot of exposed steel in the rust areas? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, with respect to, actually, that's all I have. Thank you. Just a couple of questions. In any of those areas, starting at the garage, do you find evidence of rust stains? 
Not that I remember, sir. You notice it whether or not under the undercarriage of the vehicle there was some rust. Uh, yes. No further questions. Nothing further. Thank you. Detective Riley, you may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. The time is now 310. Uh, you have another witness for this afternoon. We do, Your Honor. Judge, we do well, we have to take up a couple of matters correct. in advance. So what the court is going to do is allow the jury to take the afternoon recess now. <coughs> well, how long do you anticipate your argument on the matter that we have to take up? I think probably 15 minutes, Your Honor. So we'll allow the recess now. It may be that the recess, ladies and gentlemen, will be a little more extended than usual. We hope you're not disappointed. We'll stand in our uh, afternoon recess. <coughs>
Honorable Superior Court is now opening back in session. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Please be seated. Thank you. Would understand there is matter to be taken up. Yes, Judge. Uh, good afternoon. May it please the court, Your Honor. There's actually two matters that we're asking that the court take up at this time. Um, you'll recall late on Friday, the state inquired about the court hearing the defendant's motion for a porter hearing with respect to STR Mix, which is um, a deconvolution software that the state laboratory uses when interpreting DNA results. We did file a written objection on Friday, which I did email to the court. Um, and uh, we're asking that that be heard now, or at least at some point today, um, because we were intending on introducing DNA evidence as early as tomorrow, depending on scheduling, of course. And then there's a motion that deals specifically with the next witness, which was filed by the defense last week, which was specifically to exclude any and all evidence of um, so-called marital discord between Mr. Fotis Dulos and Ms. Jennifer Dulos, um, along with uh, hearsay. So that is going to be coming up during the next witness, and so I certainly didn't want to run through the stop sign of the motion in limine. Thank you. So the court will take up first the, if we would have to call it what the code calls it, prior bad act. I can just have a moment, Your Honor. I apologize, Your Honor. I'm just looking for it uh, written out. Well, I'll probably be able to do it from memory in any event, Your Honor. So I'll, I'll, I'll just note, Your Honor, um, just a couple of things with respect to the so-called uh, prior bad acts. Um, firstly, this is a defense objection, but we are going to be making the offer. So I just want to alert the court as to um, what we intend on offering through this next witness. Um, and they've also moved to exclude uh, alleged hearsay statements from Jennifer Barbadoulos as well, and I'd like to uh, take those up at the appropriate time uh, additionally, Your Honor. But um, essentially, Your Honor, um, the defense in this case, as I understand it, from some of the cross-examination which we have heard so far, specifically with respect to presumptive blood tests, as I understand the defense, they are not conceding that there was actually blood in the garage. They're not conceding that Jennifer Dulos is deceased, and they're not conceding that Otis Dulos is responsible for her murder. Now, I could stand mistaken on that, but I don't think that we're going to be hearing those concessions this afternoon from the defense. So I bring this up, Your Honor, because obviously, in light of the fact that none of those things are conceded at this point, the court needs to decide whether or not animus between Otis Dulos and Jennifer Dulos is relevant to this case. And I did file um, a written objection this morning, Your Honor. But I would pose to the court this hypothetical as the court considers this motion. I want the court to consider if the defense had moved to exclude any and all mention of the fact that Otis Dulos and Jennifer Dulos were married. Let's just say they had moved to exclude that and the court granted their motion, the jury would naturally be sitting here wondering why Fotis Dulos would have murdered a random woman in Ukraine. It is the story of their marriage and the story of their discord and the story of their divorce that served as the motivation that culminated in the death and murder of Fotis <coughs> Dulos. That is our theory of the case. And Ms. Lauren Almeida, 
is going to be testifying on behalf of the state in just a moment. And what the evidence is going to reveal, Your Honor, is that she was the uh, nanny for the Dulos family from 2012 until 2019. And she was present for a series of events, including the breakup of Fotis Dulos and Jennifer Dulos in the spring and summertime of 2017. And she's going to be detailing very specific events for the court. Specifically, she's going to be detailing how, um, upon the decision to separate, Mr. Dulos chased Jennifer Dulos around with a piece of paper. That at one point there was they were in some type of screaming match, and he chased Jennifer Dulos upstairs and burst into the room. Um, yes, she looked terrified when he was uh, chasing after her. She's going to testify about the antagonistic behavior he showed towards her during those months um, leading up to her finally leaving the home. Um, specifically, Your Honor, that he had threatened to take the children into Greece. Um, she's going to talk about an event in which he allowed the 11 year old children and the 8 year old children to drive his Porsche. Uh, around a very uh, dangerous uh, area, um, thus upsetting Jennifer, that these uh, things um, were occurring and seemed to be designed to antagonize Jennifer during the months after they had apparently decided to separate but were still living together. She's going to detail for the court how he reacted when Jennifer surreptitiously left the home with the children in June of 2017, that he acted erratically towards her in court her being Lauren Almeida, that he accused her of kidnapping her kids because she went with Jennifer with the children to New York. She's going to discuss the fact that Fotis Dulos um, yelled at her when she dropped the kids off and said that she needed to be the voice of reason with his wife, Jennifer Dulos. Um, all of these things, Your Honor, are probative to Mr. Dulos' um, animus towards Jennifer Dulos and serve as the motivation for why he would commit this crime. Because the evidence is going to show that despite the fact that it had been nearly two years from Jennifer Dulos leaving the home until um, her alleged murder, that they still weren't divorced. That they were in the midst of ongoing um, marital discord. And the defendant, Your Honor, actually spoke about that marital discord during her interviews with the police. She indicated that, I don't know the exact phrase, but I believe it was two years of hell or two years of torture when she was speaking about uh, Mr. Dulos' divorce proceedings with his uh, then wife, um, Jennifer Dulos. She joked about how she wished Jennifer would just disappear. So this also serves as the motive for why the defendant would conspire with Mr. Dulos to kill Jennifer Dulos. And as the defense has repeatedly said during voir dire, the state has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Fotis Dulos murdered Jennifer Dulos. They have repeatedly said that. So the fact that Fotis Dulos would have been motivated to harm Jennifer Dulos and all of the discord leading up and explaining that motivation is highly probative to Mr. Dulos' intent, his motivation, whether or not he would have conspired with the defendant, his live-in girlfriend, it also goes directly to an element of the case that the state has to prove. And so, you know, if we look at some of the jurisprudence in this state, and I think I directed the court to State versus Lopez, 280 Con 795, just as an example, anytime there has been sort of hostile acts towards the same victim, Courts have routinely held that that is probative of the actor's intent and motivation. So, unless the defense is conceding that Mr. Dulos committed this crime, that Jennifer Dulos is deceased, the probative value of this was extremely high before their cross-examinations, it's astronomically high now. And so I am asking that the court uh, allow Ms. Almeida to testify about those events. There was an additional event which I neglected to mention which was shortly, um, I don't want to say shortly, but after Jennifer Dulos had left the home, there was an event in which Mr. Dulos almost hit her with the car. And Miss Almeida returned to the home. 
shortly after, and Jennifer Dulos explained that situation to her. And she was extremely shaken up. And um, all of these things, Judge, we believe are probative again to the animus that we would have harbored uh, towards her. With respect to, um, and if I could just have one moment, Judge? Yeah. With respect to the um, alleged hearsay statements, I would just indicate the following to the court. Number one, the statements that we're going to be offering that Jennifer made to Miss Almeida are either not being offered for their truth or meet a well-recognized hearsay exception. And I just want to give you some examples. Barber's then existing belief that Duos was having an affair in part because he had been more distant. We're not going to be offering that to show that Mr. Dulos was actually more distant in marriage. We're going to be offering it to show that Jennifer Dulos believed that their marriage was in turmoil and believed he was having an affair. Her then existing belief that she had found proof of the affair. Her future intention to confront Dulos about the affair. Her then existing fear of Dulos. Her then existing emotional state that she was not in love with Dulos anymore. Her then existing fear that the defendant would take her children to Greece and not return, which, by the way, is independently corroborated. Lauren Almeida actually witnessed an event where he threatened to take the children to Greece. Her intention to divorce Dulos. Her then existing hope that the divorce proceedings would go smoothly. Her intention to leave the defendant, including her future plan to surreptitiously leave the house, and her fear that Dulos would find out. Her request that Lauren Almeida continue to work with her after she had left Dulos and her intention to take the Chevrolet Suburban to a doctor's appointment in New York on May 24, 2019. All of those things, Your Honor, just by way of example, are then existing state of mind, the statements of an intention to do something in the immediate future, and therefore qualify as a state of mind exception under 83, subsection 4 of the Connecticut Code of Evidence. So um, they're not testimonial. There's no suggestion that these statements were made in anticipation of any criminal uh, proceeding. They're made to the nanny, um, and she, that's what she's going to be testifying to, Judge. So all of these things, again, the well-recognized hearsay exceptions I would direct the court. <coughs> There's a more recent case, State versus Ayala, but I also directed the court in our memorandum to State versus NIMS. Victim statements as to others as to why he was traveling to Connecticut, specifically that he was concerned with how the defendant was handling his sister's affairs, it was not offered for the truth, but rather to explain why the victim went to Connecticut. State versus Smith, victim statements to others. Uh, excuse me. Um, with respect to the statements about the event with the car, Your Honor, we're offering those as spontaneous utterances. And um, I would just indicate that State versus Smith, which is 275 Con at 217, quote, it is well established in our jurisprudence that where a marital or romantic relationship existed between a homicide victim and the defendant, evidence of the victim's fear of the defendant suggests a deterioration of that relationship, which is relevant to the issues of motive and intent. Now, what I'm gathering from the defense, even though they're apparently not conceding that Mr. Dulos is even responsible for this crime or that the crime occurred at all, is that there's somehow spillover prejudice to the defendant. Um, but again, um, this is highly probative evidence as to why Mr. Lewis would commit this crime. We're going to flush out later on in the trial why it was also probative to why the defendant would conspire with Mr. Dulos. And so we're asking that the court allow this evidence. We think it's very probative. Thank you. Tony Schoenhorn. <clears throat> I guess we have to separate the fact, two, two issues here. The first is that it sounds to me that if Fotis Dulos was on trial for this, the state would be seeking to offer this kind of evidence, and most of it would be explicitly prohibited against uh, Mr. Dulos because of its prejudicial uh, effect and its remoteness. This court, early on, when, before we started uh, evidence, I attempted to get certain documents from the divorce file because it sounds to me that the state wants to litigate a dissolution action that never reached its conclusion. The court, in the most recent 
court proceedings involving the Dulos versus Dulos matter prohibited the defense from having access to those documents. I want to preface my remarks with that because what I'm hearing now is the state wants to litigate matters from 2016 and 2017, years before the uh, uh, disappearance of Jennifer Dulos and the allegations that are set forth in the complaint. So first, there, there are a number of, of issues that apply here. The first is that most of what I just heard is not relevant because it has nothing to do with Michelle Traconis. It also would not be relevant as a motive against Fotis Dulos because of the fact of, that it occurred before the divorce. It's also relevant for your court's determination. There's no violence involved here. Every one of the cases that the, the, that the state has cited involve prior acts of actual physical violence. What we have here are arguments, arguments about whether the children should uh, go water skiing, whether they were loud, whether they, somebody wanted, whether Mr. Dulos wanted his wife to sign a, a, um, a custody agreement, which is what the claim chasing her around, quote unquote, with a piece of paper is all about, to sign an agreement as to when the children would go, in other words, without litigating it, to agree to those terms. This might be true of any dissolution action, not only in Connecticut, but probably in the entire United States of America. So the, the problem we also have, which is unique to this case, is the, that all of these incidents were part of an attempt by Jennifer Dulos to obtain a restraining order. I want to emphasize, because the court may not be aware, Judge Collin had a multi-day hearing where all of these claims were litigated, and he found it not credible. That is, he denied the restraining order. So we have, for, at the level of a preponderance of the evidence, a coordinate judge of this court finding that the evidence did not met, meet the minimum requirements for a restraining order, and he denied uh, Jennifer Dulos' motion uh, for, for um, a restraining order. Again, it is testimonial in another coordinate proceeding. It was done for purposes of litigation. These allegations were made during the course of that. It was denied in that court. So how is the court here going to allow the same evidence in here without bringing in the actual findings, rulings by the judge in the divorce case, and then, of course, this all goes back to 2016 and 2017. The fact that there were uh, there was di that, that kind of discord is not the kind of violence that would permit the court to uh, permit to allow that to be presented, especially in a case of this nature. The um, the police were not involved at that point. There's no contemporaneous documentation. Again, this was something that was prepared in affidavits for purposes of court. Ms. Almeida testified in support of the uh, motion for uh, restraining order. I think it's important also to realize that to the extent that there has to be reference to the fact that it was an ongoing dissolution matter, perhaps it's also relevant that uh, Ms. Almeida was part of the planned by Ms. Dulos to simply disappear from the house and leave without notice and to ignore the police inquiry, which is what, what happened back then. If the court looks at some of the cases, for example, um, State versus Espinal is a good example of that, where we talk about whether or not claims, and, and it, there are a couple of, I have to separate this out because on the one hand you've got couple of incidents where Ms. Almeida witnessed arguments between Fotis Dulos and his wife. Um, there was no physical touching whatsoever. It was following and yelling. That was the nature of it. Then we have a hearsay statement that Jennifer told the babysitter that 
Fotis drove into the driveway recklessly, apparently telling her that he was allowing the children to drive the, one of his cars, to drive the Porsche. These were issues that she found to be unreasonable. It may have been part of the reason that she, that she wanted to leave. And yes, there may be evidence that she, quote, found out that Mr. Dulos was having an affair. But again, that is a far cry from suggesting it is relevant to a claim motive if two and a half years later, at least over two years later, to do away with his wife. Particularly, Your Honor, and this is why Your Honor's past ruling plays a role here. Everyone who was involved in the, in the that was involved with Mr. Dulos, his lawyers, the guardian ad litem, other people that were aware of it knew that the report by the independent evaluator, the custodial uh, evaluator, the psychologist, had recommended that Mr. Dulos was the better parent, that he was, that he was a better, more caring parent than Jennifer, and that therefore he was recommending joint equal custody noting that Jennifer Dulos was opposed to that, and that Jennifer Dulos was refusing to turn over her psychiatric record so he could evaluate more, uh, uh, in more detail whether or not she needed some additional counseling and whatnot to help facilitate the transition to joint custody. I submit, Your Honor, that opening up that can of worms is going to permit all of that, including the evidence that, the, that Dr. Herman testified, which is why I was trying to get those, those transcripts, which the court denied uh, my right to have them, even though I submit under Davis versus Alaska, now it would be relevant to the issue of right to cross-examine anyone who's gonna be testifying about hearsay about the, the discord and the divorce. Why is that also important, as Your Honor may recall, if any hearsay is allowed in, under our rules, it allows the opposing party to bring in any other hearsay as if the speaker was actually on the stand. And all of that would suddenly become relevant. It could actually delay this trial by having a week of testimony about who was the better parent, who was, quote, winning, unquote, in the divorce proceeding, which I assume that's not what we're here for. In State versus, um, a couple of cases I just want to bring to Your Honor's attention. In State versus Espinal, for example, there was some evidence about the, um, the marriage being uh, discord, but in that case, there was actual violence, and it was relevant because it showed the current state of fear of the spouse when, the, when, there was, when she disappeared. This is something, again, that goes back years and there is no evidence, none of recent discord. In fact, Your Honor will, will hear at this trial that there was a party two days before at the New Canaan house. I don't know if Your Honor is even aware that this occurred, but there, there was a party at the house where Mr. Dulos was present, the children were there, the independent uh, evaluator was present as well, and uh, there was a sharing of food between Jennifer and her still husband at that time. So that, that's going to come in no matter what. That comes in. But to suggest that a babysitter should be allowed to say, well, they were arguing, they were screaming, whether or not uh, he at one point while they were still married threatened to take the children to Greece. That has nothing to do with what's going on at the time where an evaluator within three to four weeks of the disappearance had concluded in an 80-page report, which I'll note I have, that says that Mr. Dulos would be the better parent for these children, but he was recommending equal uh, sharing of custody in this case. There's also the case, Your Honor, State versus um, Reynolds, where even though the court allowed in a narrow, narrow amount of evidence regarding the uh, uh, a claim of seeking a restraining order that never was filed it was only application of, its, of itself. None of the affidavit, none of the specifics of it, and the court was required to give a very, very specific um, 
cautionary instruction that could not be considered for the truth of the matter. But as I hear what Mr. McGinnis is saying, he wants this all to be about a claim motive that he was yelling at his, there was argument going on years, a few years before, not in the interim. It's not it was like it was ongoing. Two years before, before she filed for divorce. And then everything else went through the court. They were using the court process the way it was intended to. She made claims. They were denied. They were in the process of trying to work out issues such as finances. They were working out uh, the custodial arrangement. Mr. Dulos was meeting with, was seeing his children, albeit, albeit at that time there was an order that he had to have a, uh, an independent supervisor because he had apparently told one of his children, according to the file, had told one of his children to uh, not mention uh, the fact that he had uh, Mr. Conus moving into the house with her own daughter. And so as a result of that, they had issued an order that he could, for a period of time that he could only see his children with an independent evaluator present, which was done, which was documented, which occurred on a regular basis. So I'm not suggesting that the, that the state can't bring up that there was an ongoing divorce. Number one, the only thing that Ms. Almeida knows about it is hearsay. She might have read some documents. She might have heard, talked to the lawyer for Ms. Dulos because she did testify at that hearing. But again, that's an out-of-court statement, testimonial in nature. Therefore, all of that is both a not only hearsay, but it's a, a denial right to confront and cross-examine because it was testimonial in nature. That is, for purposes of legal process. And it doesn't matter, it's not this case. It was for a divorce case that was in litigation at that point. Let's see if I've covered. There might be one more point I wanted to make. I think the state was trying to argue that when Ms. Dulos told the babysitter, Ms. Almeida, certain things, I assume he's trying to argue they were some kind of uh, spontaneous, excited utterances, but even the way he explained it just now suggested that she later told her about it, and so therefore you, one cannot even claim that it happened under the, uh, without the opt opportunity for contemplation, that it happened suddenly that was spontaneous in that sense. Um, and I note that the uh, Reynolds case, it was two months, one to two months after the prior incident, so it was still considered relevant. This is years uh, later, and it did not involve any violence. Finally, and I, I should mention this, um, there, there was a suggestion in, in one of the documents, and I think by Miss by Miss Almeida, that Jennifer told her that Mr. Dulles had per at one point had purchased a firearm. Now, when the restraining order was filed, it was turned into the Farmington Police, and it was never, to anyone's knowledge, ever recovered. It was never returned to Mr. Dulos at any time. But I assume, since the state didn't mention that, it has no intention of trying to elicit that, because there are several cases, the one that comes to mind is State versus Gerald Amo from the mid-'80s, I think, that said that any mention of a firearm, when there's no evidence of firearms in the case, is one of the most prejudicial things that could happen in front of a jury. And I note that, especially in this day and age, where there's all these mass shootings and all these, uh, on almost a daily basis, that would be so prejudicial for that to be blurted out that there'd be no way, short of a mistrial, that that could be remediated at that point. Finally, there's no such thing as transferred motive. So even if this arguably, to a minimal extent, and with a very truncated uh, offer of proof was admissible against Mr. Dulos. There's no, there's transferred intent is if um, I throw a rock and I'm trying to hit uh, victim A and it misses and hits victim B, that's, there's a transferred intent in the actor 
to uh, the, vic the second victim. It's not reciprocal, however, and it doesn't go to another person who's standing to the side. It's just not relevant. Um, and it certainly can't be used because it would even predate the allegation of a conspiracy or anything of that nature. And therefore, there's no way to attribute that knowledge and those specific incidents to Ms. Traconis under any circumstances anyway. The fact that the divorce kept going is one thing. The fact that she said in her statement to the police that it was like, I think the term is two years of hell, doesn't mean that the specific acts of misconduct, of mis alleged acts against Mr. Tr Mr. Dulos then can be applied to Ms. Traconis. With, I'll just mention very briefly, there's been some suggestion that it goes to state of mind. Whatever the state of mind is of Jennifer Dulos, He's not covered in this case under either 8-3 subsection 2 or 8-3 subsection 4. Telling her that I'm going to be taking a certain vehicle to New York, for example, although not particularly prejudicial, is you know, I'm, I'm only raising it because that's not the kind of state of mind that would be relevant to the examination. The fact that she was going to New York might be and then didn't show up. That is relevant. But to suggest that one person said, I'm going to be taking one vehicle and you have a choice of two is not the kind of evidence that goes to the state of mind. It's just not relevant or material in this case. Let me just see if I've um, make sure I covered everything. There's one last point that what I see is happening here is the state whole theory so far seems to be that they're going to tar Ms. Traconis with what happened that may or may not have involved Mr. Dulos directly. If he was on trial, maybe some of this with a cautionary instruction might be admissible, but it's not only so remote as to Mr. Dulos. When you try and drag my client into this, We've now gone so far off the playing field, we're out of the stadium, we're not even in the parking lot, we're down the street by the highway exit. And that is what we seem to be doing here. None of this evidence applies to Ms. Traconis. And therefore, it is so highly prejudicial, the state has been allowed a lot of leeway, I would suggest more than I believe. You know, I'm not shy about objecting, as the court probably has noticed, but in any event, the, the that I believe has already gone so far down, uh, given the, the state leeway to put on evidence that will later not be uh, connected. And so for them to be able to put on such evidence, leave that speculation out there only later on to show it has nothing to do with Ms. Traconis. And some of it, in fact, has nothing to do with Mr. Dulos either, but I'm not objecting on that basis. But here we have a witness who can testify to certain things that occurred on that week. We're not objecting to any of the stuff that happened during the month of May of 2019, including the fact there were some court proceedings going on. But what happened at them, what the rulings were, what motions were being filed, any of that is both testimonial and therefore it violates the Confrontation Clause of the state and federal constitution, as well as inadmissible hearsay. Based on that, Your Honor, I didn't hear the state separating out its claim. He just made all these things as if he's going to get into all of them. Some of them I might not object to. But since he didn't say one, two, three, or four, he just said, this is all what we're going to bring in. I'm not going to suggest which ones he might be able to get into that way that he wouldn't object. Attorney McGinnis. Yes, Judge. I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that we have a jury waiting. I did just want to respond to a few things. Um, firstly, I, I'm not going to get into you know, who has a better theory of the case at this point, because as near as I can tell, the defense's theory is that Jennifer Dulos, shortly before disappearing, ran over a squirrel in her garage that was eating a cheeseburger. Okay? 
So the issue I'm going to the chair to such pejorative, sarcastic remarks. Well, 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 before we proceed, there's no jury in the courtroom. The court can understand <coughs> the cut and thrust of argument. The court is not going to rule on an objection that is not evidentiary. But I can understand that against some comments, counsel, either for the defense or for the state, may take offense. But unless those comments become unprofessional, the court is going to allow both parties to ride the wave of zeal. Turn him again. So Judge, just responding to some of the specific things with respect to this issue of remoteness, we're talking about an ongoing discord over the course of two years leading up to Jennifer Dulos's death. And even by the defense's own argument at this point, uh, shortly apparently before Jennifer Dulos disappeared and we believe was murdered, there was some report that she was opposed to, thus indicating further uh, animus and discord between the parties. I would also just note, Your Honor, that in terms of the balancing that the court has to do, I think the defense sort of made our argument for us, which was that none of these acts involve a particularly uh, violent act on behalf of Mr. Dulos. So in terms of whether or not this is going to somehow inflame the passions of the jury, uh, I don't think that the court needs to worry about that because the acts themselves are substantially less probative than the allegation that he murdered um, Ms. Dulos. And I did not mention a gun. I did not mention a restraining order in my argument. I tried to keep my offer of proof to what I intend on showing um, through this witness. And we spent an inordinate amount of time talking about things that weren't part of our offer of proof. I'll also just indicate, Your Honor, that when the defense said that if hearsay is admitted, any other hearsay from that person can be admissible. I'm not familiar with a case that stands for that proposition. I'm obviously familiar with the rule of completeness, uh, but any other hearsay, I'd love to see that case. Uh, so I don't think the court has to worry about there somehow being an undue consumption of time. And just because the defense attorney says that something's testimonial doesn't make it so. Um, they have not cited a single case that any of the statements, which they've been on notice of, that Lauren Almeida is going to testify to, that Ms. Barber Dulos made to her are somehow testimonial in nature. So I would ask the court um, allow us to uh, to have the witness testify to the specific acts that we've talked about, and um, just ask the court to deny their objection. Thank you. Well, the court is going to scan a few items using a grocery store analogy. First. Council spent in almost every case of every juror about at least one hour to determine which jurors would be appropriate jurors for this case. One of the salient questions to the jury concerned the ability to pay attention. And that was with regard to the anticipated number of hours of video evidence. Well, the court is going to credit the jury with being able to pay attention beyond many hours of video evidence. So the fact that some evidence may hang for a while before being picked up is not a reason for this court to believe that this jury cannot tie up evidence when it is time for them to deliberate. Secondly, there is a discussion between testimonial and non-testimonial hearsay. So the court has to hearken to Crawford v. Washington. If the testimony is non Rather, if the evidence is non-testimonial, then the 
rules of evidence would apply. If the evidence is testimonial, then that evidence cannot run afoul of the defense's right under the Sixth Amendment. But we leave that discussion there. It was indicated by, not indicated, it was stated by the defense that this court would have to relitigate the family matter, the dissolution matter. This court in no way litigates the dissolution matter. The dissolution matter involves testimony and rulings concerning alimony, pendente lite and post-judgment, child support, pendente lite, custody, pendente lite, and after dissolution, visitation, health insurance costs, educational costs, exclusive use and possession of the marital home, pendente lite, and post-judgment. This court is not litigating the family matter. So that premise is without merit. Under our rules, prior bad acts may not be admissible to prove bad character, criminal tendencies, or proclivity. However, prior bad acts may be admitted for other purposes such as motive, malice, intent, identity, knowledge, absence of mistake or accident, a system of criminal activity, common scheme or plan, evidence that will help corroborate crucial prosecution testimony, or to prove an element of the offense. Nevertheless, if prior bad acts are admitted, the probative value has to outweigh the danger of unfair prejudice. So the court cannot remember the, the court will refer to it as the grocery list of statements from the next witness. However, the court cannot at this point determine where those groceries will go until it hears more from the witness. In this case, as the court has stated before in discussions with counsel, the hearsay exception of state of mind cannot consume every thought that the declarant had and make it available to the jury. Because then that exception becomes the rule. In this court's view, the then existing mental or emotional condition of the declarant has to be focused. In other words, it's not just a matter of what the declarant said under a certain set of circumstances. The exception goes to the mental or emotional state. For example, fear or anxiety or terror. So simply everything that Jennifer Farber Dulos may have said to the housekeeper from what the court heard from the state would not fall into that category. But the court would have to hear the testimony. So concerning the issue of prior bad acts and what may be admissible, the court at this point understands that the testimony can go to malice and motive. However, 
everything that is said does not go to malice and motive as expressed from what the court understood the state plans to elicit. So the court will be keen to entertain the objections if it appears, even if it does not appear, that simply everything Jennifer Farber Dulo said to her housekeeper is coming into evidence. That is not the court's understanding of the state of mind exception to the hearsay. So the court is going to allow testimony of marital discord. However, the fact that there is marital discord in this court's view is not exceedingly probative. It's whether or not the statements by Jennifer Farber Dulos go to motive to murder, her fear, her anxiety, her terror. Not simply whether she did not like something that Fotis Dulos was doing. So the court is going to allow testimony of marital discord, but the court will be keen to essentially use a calendar, a colander, to determine what is relevant and what is not. Do we need to take you know, the Porter factors and the discussion of Porter is going to take up too much time right now. The jury is out. However, the state's witness is probably not going to be done today. We still have a half hour. So That's what correct. the court would prefer to do is take up the next witness tomorrow morning, take up the quarter argument. That's, that's fine with the state judge. I'll just note that um, what we're probably going to do then is not ask the representative from the laboratory to come tomorrow. Depending on the court's ruling, we'd ask that she come on Thursday. Well, what's the, well, the lineup for tomorrow is probably going to be Miss Almeida, correct? Correct. And after Miss Almeida. We have Detective Tom Pat. But I don't anticipate his testimony is going to be terribly long. But Miss Almeida may take a, a substantial portion of the day. Thank you. So we'll start now with Miss Almeida. A quick question, Your Honor. Um, if the court is going to allow some of the marital discord testimony, will the court give a, a cautionary instruction to the jury about the limited nature of that testimony, and specifically in light of the fact that it's only well, it's relevant to maybe the, the allegation involving Mr. Dulos, but is even one step further removed from Mr. Cohen's in that regard. Well, the court will consider limiting instruction after both the state and the defense have had the opportunity to cross examine of and course. examine. Of later. Course. to stipulate to the presence of all of the jurors. Yes, Judge. Your Honor, the state calls Lauren Almeida. Thank you. 
solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm as the case may be that the evidence you shall give concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, shall help you God or upon penalty of perjury? Yes. Please state your name and spell it for the record. Lauren Almeida, L-A-U-R-E-N-A-L-M-E-I-D-A. -E and your business address? Um, well, there's no need for a business address. Yeah. You may be seated, thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Almeida. Good afternoon. Ms. Almeida, how old are you? 32. And where did you grow up? Newington, Connecticut. Who do you um, currently live with? I live with um, the Dulos kids. And did you graduate high school? I did. Which high school did you attend? Uh, Newington High School. Could you just keep your voice up just a little bit? Newington High School. And uh, did you also attend college? Yes. Where did you go to school? Uh, University of Connecticut. And what did you study at the University of Connecticut? Psychology. Did you graduate? Yes. What year did you graduate? 2013. And uh, you mentioned that you currently live with the Dulos children. Mm -hmm. Did you know someone by the name of Jennifer Dulos? Yes. When was the last time you saw or spoke to Jennifer Dulos? May 24, 2019. And did you know someone by the name of Fotis Dulos? Yes. How did you know Jennifer and Fotis Dulos? Um, I nannied for them starting in September of 2012. Were Jennifer and Fotis Dulos married? Yes. When you met them in September of 2012, where were they living? Uh, Fort Jefferson Crossing in Farmington. Where was Mr. Dulos originally from? Greece. Did he speak English? Yeah. Did he speak with an accent? Yeah. Where was Jennifer Dulos originally from? Uh, New York. And you mentioned the Dulos children. How many children did the Dulos family have? Five. And what are the children's names? We have Petros, Theodore, Christian, Constantine, and Noel. And could you give the jury their age ranges currently? Yep. Currently, Petros and Theodore are 17, Christian and Constantine are 15, and Noel is 13. And you mentioned that Petros and Theodore are 17 and Constantine and uh, Christian are 15. 15. Are they twins? Yeah. So the Dulos has had two sets of twins? Yep, two sets. And when you met them in September of 2012, what was their respective age range? Uh, Noel just turned <coughs> one, I believe. Christian and Constantine were four, just turned four. And Petros and Theodore were six. How did you get introduced to the Dulos family in 2012? I worked at a daycare center for a few years, and someone that I used to also babysit outside of the daycare told me that she knew someone yeah, that needed said. help. Well, the question is, how did you end up working for the Dulos family? Well, it, this is preliminary, the overrule. You had mentioned that you worked at a daycare center. Would you just continue your answer? Yeah, so someone that worked for Jennifer and Fotis said that she knew of a family that needed extra help, and I babysat outside of the daycare. So she introduced myself and my sister. And was your sister also a babysitter? Yeah. What's your sister's name? Ashley. When did you first actually begin babysitting for the family? It was September of 2012. I don't know the exact date. How often would you babysit them beginning in September of 2012? It started off just like a Saturday or a Sunday. Like I would usually work Saturday and my sister would usually work Sunday or we would swap. Um, and then over time I started to work more and more for them. Were you and your sister the only babysitters for the Dulos family? No. You mentioned that you would work a Saturday or a Sunday. What were your typical hours at that point? It varied, um, but usually like early morning, like 6 a.m. sometimes, because Noel would wake up early, and I wouldn't leave until like sometimes 9 or 10. 
Were you still attending school when you first began babysitting for the Buell's family? Yeah, I was in my final year. What types of activities would you do with the children while you were babysitting with them? Uh, we did a lot of puzzles, magnet tiles, and games, board games was a lot. They like to play pretend and dress up. Um, they also water skied, so we would spend a lot of time doing that. Um, and would you actually go water ski with them? Yeah. What did Mr. Dulos do for work when you first met the family? Uh, he owned his construction business. What was the name of the company? Ford Group. And you mentioned that it was a construction company. What type of construction? Uh, he was building luxury homes. <coughs> Where was the office for Ford Group located? It was in Fort Jefferson Crossing. It's in their, their home. Whereabouts in their home? It was like right above the garage. They had a two bay garage, and above that was a space for the office. What did Jennifer do for work when you met the family? I knew she was a writer, but I didn't really know much more than that. Were uh, Mr. Fotis Dulos and Jennifer Dulos ever home while you babysat? Yeah. How often would you say they were home while you were babysitting? Most of the time. How would you describe the dynamic of the Dulos marriage when you met them in 2012? Um, I mean, I tried not to judge, but he was gone a lot, but I just figured that was just kind of what it was in their, their house. But overall, when I first started working for them, they seemed to get along just fine. And how did they act towards one another? Uh, in the beginning. Um, in the beginning, they were nice towards each other. I mean, from what I saw, at least in the beginning. I'm sorry, I missed that? From what I saw, at least in the beginning. And did you continue to babysit for the family for the remainder of your final year of college? Yeah. And for that final year of college, were you just working weekends? Uh, yeah, because I was going to school during the week. I want to direct your attention now to May of 2013. Did your role with the family change at that point? Yeah, so May 2013, I graduated college, and I didn't really have a job um, in place yet, and Jennifer offered me a full-time position with the kids. And what days of the week were you, well, I guess I should ask a preliminary question, which is, did you accept the job? Yes. And at that point, did you become the sole babysitter or nanny for the children? I guess I became like the main one, but there were still some people that would come in, or sometimes there would be two of us, mostly on the weekends, because um, the kids were in school, or they were like at least in preschool, so it's easier with just with one. But And what days of the week were you working for the family at this point, now that you're a full-time employee? I think it was like Monday through Saturday, so I always worked a weekend day, but it was like half a day, so I wouldn't go in until like maybe like... 11 or 12. And when you say half a day, you're referring to the weekend day? No, the weekend day was like a full day from morning to night. So during the week while the kids were in school, I didn't have to show up like as early as I would on the weekend. And what was a typical work day for you as the nanny? Uh, well, the younger ones, it's like, you know, helping feed them or helping Jennifer if they had like certain activities that day. Um, which playing with them, keeping them busy, playing outside, giving them baths. Um, I would help with dinner, help with like cleaning up after them. During this time period, did you ever go on vacation with the family? Yes. Where did you go on vacation with the family? All the places. Yes. Uh, so I've gone to St. Bart's with them. I've been to Florida. I've been to Greece a few times. Um, I went to Virginia once with Fotis. We went to Colorado. Did both Jennifer and Mr. Dulos attend these vacations? Um, not all of them. All right. And when you say not all of them, who would not attend? Jennifer. And did Mr. Dulos ever travel without the children or Jennifer? Yeah. Can you describe the dynamic between... Mr. Dulos and his children? Yeah, I mean, when they were younger, they kind of just, 
I mean, they listened to whatever their dad said. They didn't get a lot of time with their dad, so their time was mostly on the weekend. And I was with them most of the time on the weekend. So um, they just they did whatever photos asked them to do. Um, but yeah, that was like the main time that he spent with the kids. How often would Mr. Dulos travel without the family? A lot. Where I don't know the exact days, but enough where it was, you could tell it was a little odd how often he was traveling. Could you describe the dynamic between Jennifer and the children? Yeah, it was very silly, her relationship with the kids. Um, they always wanted to be next to mommy. It was just kind of what it was. And she would sing to them and laugh at them. And she never raised her voice. So he was like so soft spoken and never got angry. And um, she was just like incredibly nurturing. What types of activities did Jennifer like to do with the children? Oh, she would take them to like, we'd go to the, like these bounce houses all the time um, with Jennifer, but like around the holidays through, you know, getting the Christmas tree was a really big deal and going to pumpkin picking and she'd um, draw with them, do puzzles with them. Did Jennifer like to water ski? No. You had mentioned that the children did like to water ski, however, correct? They water skied. Did, did they not like to water ski? Oh. They water skied a lot. Um, so I saw times where they didn't want to, but still had to. And as you worked full time for the Dulos family, did you begin to develop a friendship with Jennifer? Yeah. How would you describe your relationship with her? Um, I confided in her with a lot of things, like in my personal life. I just always trusted her. Um, she was someone. She was my boss, but she was someone that, you know, I always just, we just connected really well. We just worked well to, with each other. I knew what she liked, what she didn't. She knew what I was good at. It just, we had a really good relationship. Did you ever meet any of Jennifer's family? Yeah. Who have you met? Um, her mom, Gloria, her father, Hilly, when he was alive, um, her sister, Melissa. Um, I've met her cousins. And you mentioned your father, has he passed away? Yeah. What year did he pass away? I think it was February of 2018, I think. And is Gloria still alive? Yeah. How old is Gloria? You no, know, I think she's 88 or 89, but I don't want to get that wrong. But she's, she's great. Did there come a point in time when Jennifer began Fighting in you things about her relationship with Mr. Dulos? Yeah. Did Jennifer ever express to you her feelings on whether Mr. Dulos was paying enough attention to her? Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Jennifer ever expressed to you a desire to avoid arguing with Mr. Dulos? Objection, Your Honor. Overruled. Uh, yeah. Did you tell the jury what she said? Uh, she just felt like arguing with Otis, like he was harsh and she didn't like conflict, so she could never really like express how she really felt because it kind of just kind of got looked over. Now, I want to direct your attention to September of 2013. Mm -hmm. Did you begin working at the board group? Yeah. Did Mr. Did Mr. Dulos, by the way, did he own the board group for the entire time that he babysat and nannied for the family? From what I knew, yeah. How did you come to begin working for board group? Um, so I was working full time for the family from May of 2013 that year. And like I said, I still didn't have like a full-time job the nannying was. And so he just asked if I was interested in coming into four group and, you know, having this opportunity. So I just decided to take it. And were you working full-time for four group after you took the job? No, it was like half four group and half being a nanny. What type of hours were you working for four group? 
So usually I'd go in at like 8, 30, 9 o'clock in four group. And then depending on the kid's schedule, I would have to leave around one or two. So they would basically like cross the door and then I was with the kids until like nine-ish, 9.30. And just to be clear, 9 is 9.30 at night, correct? Yeah, at night, yeah. How many days a week were you working for four group when you began being employed by Stulos? Five days, so Monday through Friday. And were you still nannying six days a week? Yeah. Did you have any regular days off? Yeah, usually at that point I was having Sundays off. Um, but if I needed like another day off, it was like with Jennifer, it was kind of easy to do that. But usually... Sundays were my day off at that time. What were your responsibilities before group? Um, in the beginning, it was really just like office work. I was like organizing folders, things like that. I would really like worked alongside Fotis, so I basically would, I would follow him along to work sites, and he would show like um, show me some things because I was totally new to this whole world. Um, and then eventually, in time, I became in charge of the punch list at Four Group, which was um, when a house was built. The owners would have a list of things that they wanted to finish off, like there's a chip here or whatever, and I would be in charge of making sure that that gets done. How did you view Mr. Dulos when you initially began working for Four Group? Oh, I saw him as like a role model and a mentor, and I thought at the time he's giving me this really great opportunity. So I really, I considered him a friend. And did Mr. Dulos encourage you to go back to school? He did, yeah. What did he encourage you to study? Uh, construction management, but he also was pushing for me to get my real estate license. Was there a telephone number that was associated with Four Group? Yeah, it was Fotis's personal phone number. When you say his personal phone number, are we talking about a landline or a cellular phone? No, like a cellular. And did you often see Mr. Dulos answering work-related calls or sending emails? Yeah. Would it be fair to say that Mr. Dulos kept his cell phone with him at all times during your time working for Four Group? Yeah. When you were working for Four Group, did Jennifer ever express to you what her intentions were with the children? Excuse me, strike that. When you were working for Four Group, did Jennifer ever express to you um, how she wanted you to handle the summers? Uh, yeah. What, what was, did she say? Kind of said that. Did Jennifer ever express to you how she wanted you to handle the children during the summers? So, the question is, did she express to you how she wanted you to handle the children? Overruled. You can answer. Okay. Um, yeah, I would basically, because the kids wouldn't be in school, so I would be with the kids full time. And how many employees did Four Group have when you began working for them? Not a lot. It was very small. So like a handful. And when you say handful, can you just be a little bit more specific for the members? Yeah, so I would, I guess, we have to count. <laughs> I would say like five or six, maybe. Was Pavel Guminiani, Guminiani one of the employees? Yep. And what was his role with you? Actually, before I ask that. When did he begin working for Four Group, to your knowledge? Oh, to my knowledge, I don't know. He was there when I started, even just babysitting before I ever even worked for Four Group, but I don't know when he started. But okay. And he knew the family for a while, that's all I knew. So by the time you began working for Four Group, he was already working for the, mm -hmm. for the Four Group, is that correct? Yes. And what was his role with the company? <coughs> uh, he was a project manager. He kind of did everything, to be honest. Did Jennifer know Mr. Gumiani as well? Yep. Would he assist her around the house? Yeah. How would he assist her around the house? Uh, he would like, you know, change out the light bulbs when they went out. He would build, He, I know he built their, they had this very beautiful playscape in the backyard. I know he built that. He would even sometimes help pick us up from the airport after a trip. Did Jennifer ever work for a Ford group? Not that I know. And you'd mentioned that Mr. Dulos was a role model to you during this time. Mm -hmm. why, why did you consider him to be a role model? Uh, when I first started working, he was 
just incredibly nice. He made me feel comfortable. He was funny. He, you know, I was fresh out of college. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And he, it sounded like I was getting this really great opportunity, even though it had nothing to do with any of the work I've ever done. And it seemed like he just wanted to push me and, you know, make me better. And did there come a point in time when the dynamic between Jennifer and Mr. Goulos began to change from when you first met them? Yeah. Did you describe how the dynamic changed for the jury? Uh, the big dynamic change was in March of 2017, which is when Jennifer found out about his affair. And a few months after that, it, it totally changed. So I want to direct your attention now to March of 2017. Did you take a trip with the Dulos family? Yeah. And where did y'all go? Uh, the kids had a two week break. And so the first week we spent in Aspen, Colorado, and then we flew to Miami for the second week. Who went on the trip? Uh, the first week was myself, five kids, Jennifer Fotis, and his friend, Mark Massiello. And then I think you already mentioned this, but why does the family decide to take a trip in March as opposed to? Oh, the kids, um, their school vacation, they get two weeks off in March. So that's why they get, we went in March. Where were the kids going to school at the time? They were going to Renbrook. It's in Farmington. I'm sorry? It's in Farmington. And when you, where in Colorado did you vacation? It was Aspen. And what types of activities did you and the children do while on the trip? Well, they ski. They're very good snow skiers. So they would ski. Um, Noel, who was younger than everyone else, we kind of would just kind of hang out, walk around the town a little bit. She would ski a little bit. Or whoever was, like, tired, they would, like, basically come back with Jennifer and I, and we would do, like, <clears throat> the hot cocoa stuff. And the other, But they skied a lot. And how old was Noel at this point? Uh, six, maybe? And where did you stay in Aspen? Uh, Jennifer's father won a house through a charity auction, so we stayed there for a week. And um, did there come a point in time during the trip where Mr. Gulos told the group he had taken the children to an adult club? Yeah. Who was present for this conversation? Myself and Jennifer. How did Jennifer react upon hearing this? She like was shocked because they were little and they were going to a day club. Um, and so she was like, we were both kind of like disgusted, I guess is the word. And what was Mr. Doulos' demeanor like as he was relaying this information? He was excited that he like paid off the people to let his kids into this day club where, yeah, he seemed really happy about it. And approximately how long did you guys stay in Colorado? It was about a week. And at some point did you travel to Miami? Yep. And I assume you flew? We flew, yeah. And who went to Miami? So myself, the five kids, Jennifer, Fotis, and then Jennifer's mom, Gloria, met us um, in Miami. And where did you stay in Miami initially? Initially, we stayed at the W um, Hotel there. And describe some of your daily activities in Miami. I assume you're not skiing anymore. <laughs> yeah, no snow skiing, but there was water skiing. So okay. they went from snow skiing and they went to Miami to water ski. So really, that was the activity. And where would the, where would the family ski? Uh, it's a Miami Ski Club. And who would go to the ski club? Uh, myself, the kids. Sometimes Noel would stay back with Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer would not go, and Fotis would go. And during this trip, did Jennifer discuss her relationship with Mr. Dulos with you? She did. Well, at this time, did Jennifer discuss her relationship with Mr. Dulos with you? The answer is either yes or no. Overruled. Is that a yes? Yes. 
And what did she tell you? Objection. Oh. What did she tell you about the relationship? I'll rephrase. What did she tell you about the relationship? Objection. Well, that question is very broad. Oh, call for an answer that could be a narrative. So the court is going to sustain the objection, but not allow, but allow you to pursue the line. You mentioned earlier that Jennifer had found out about the affair. Do you recall testifying to that? Yes. What did Jennifer say to you about the affair when you were in Miami? Objection. Well, that's going to be overruled. Uh, she told me she believed that Otis was having an affair. Did she say why she believed that? Uh, she just said she had this feeling, he's been acting weird, and I didn't really believe her at first. And when you say you didn't really believe her, what do you mean by that? At that time, I had a good relationship with Otis, and I believed him to be an honest guy. And I couldn't imagine him having an affair where there's five little kids involved. So how, what did you say to her? I said no. Brown. But what this witness said is not hearsay. This witness is testifying about what she said, not what another declarant said. It's an out of court statement now. Well, it's an out-of-court statement, but this witness is the declarant. The witness is telling the jury what she told Jennifer. She has personal knowledge about what she told Jennifer. Overruled. What did you say to Jennifer? I told her I don't think that's true. What was her demeanor like during this conversation? She was very anxious, like kind of tight. Um, and she seemed upset. Was anyone else present for this conversation? Oh uh, yeah, her mom, Gloria. Now, during this trip, did you meet someone named Michelle Traconis? Yep. Do you see Michelle, Michelle Traconis in the courtroom? Yep. Would you just point her out and tell us what color shirt she has on? Beige. Judge, she identified the defendant. Thank you. The record will reflect. Where well, did you before before you proceed, you have about two minutes. Perhaps this is an appropriate <laughs> point at which to conclude today, because you're about to go into other matters that are more significant than just identification. So, ladies and gentlemen, we will conclude today's session. We do not discuss the case. We plan to resume tomorrow at 10 o'clock. All rise. This honorable Superior Court now stands adjourned until tomorrow at 10. Thanks.